the people of South Africa, a very good morning to the leadership of the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. A very good morning to the leadership of Sun Parks and Ismangaliso, all the entities that are here. Uh, welcome back from the constituency period, uh, from the Easter holidays. Uh, those who went to church, it is my belief that you prayed for us. Um, I went to church. I went to church and prayed for all of you. Uh, uh, can I check, Chilis, if we have apologies that have been registered? Honorable Paulson has already given an indication. Yes, sir, we do have uh, apologies. Uh, Honorable Paulson is attending another meeting. Uh, minister will join the meeting at 11. Uh, Mr. Paulson is, uh, will leave at 10. And then the Office of the Auditor General, they requested a postponement. So they will brief us later during the, the term. Oh, so they are now coming? They are okay. coming. Thank you. Okay. That's fine. Welcome to yourself and the team from the department, uh, uh, from Parliament. Um, the information I have is that the department in its entirety is here, uh, led by the DG. Uh, um, there's about nine DDGs here, two acting DDGs, uh, three. Uh, chief directors, two CFOs, two PLOs, were quite many. Uh, if I was to go through all of that, it will show most of our time. But uh, all of you are welcome. Um, we hope you had a bit of a rest if you did have any. Uh, let us then proceed. Can I have a mover of the adoption of the agenda? As sorry, sorry, Chairperson. Honorable Brian. Sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, Chairperson. Just very quickly, um, I, I have to step out of the meeting at about half past 12, but I'll rejoin the meeting by one o'clock, um, just uh, so you're aware. Okay. That is noted. So, thank you. Sorry, Chair. So, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chairperson. Uh, yes, who's I'm that? Brian. Yeah, it was September from Mr. Mangaleso. Yeah, Baba. Yes. Sorry, Chairperson, to interrupt. Um, uh, we would like to apologize uh, for our CEO, uh, Mr. Sbusiso Bukosini. There's uh, a situation that it happened uh, to his uh, to his family, so he won't be part of this meeting. But uh, we do have the uh, CFO to represent him. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Thank Mtunu? Yeah, yes, yes, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I just want to, to register that uh, at uh, half past one, I'll start driving. So I might be in and out, but I'll make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm connected all the time. But where there is a, a network problem, I might have challenges. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, Honorable uh, Chairperson and Honorable Members. I am in attendance uh, today, but I'm not feeling so great. I have uh, uh, Mr. Um, <clears throat> for one minute, I forgot. Mr. Marshall, who's also part of the, our delegation. But I, depending on how I'm feeling, Chairperson, I might come in and out, but I'm going to endeavor to be here the whole meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor Ako. Uh, it's going to be a very long meeting. Um, but that's fine. Um, are those the only apologies that we have? Okay, let's get into it then. Uh, Chilis, can we fly to the, the, the second term program? No, we must get the adopter, the mover for the adoption. 
Amuche. Thank you very much, Honorable Winkler. Can we get the second? I second trade, Kancho. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Ganjo. It would seem the constituency period has, uh, honorable members have forgotten to raise hands and just speak. Um, uh, I, I believe that we will adjust as the, as the sun goes a bit up. Uh, honorable members, <clears throat> slide by slide, today it's the 18th of April. Uh, today we are going to get a briefing by Mr. Mr. J. Rodemeyer. Mr. Is, Rod is Mr. Rodemeyer here? Uh, yes, I am, Chair. Good. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Thank you, sir. And then that briefing by the Office of the Auditor General will have to be removed because they are requesting to come and present a bit later. Uh, consideration and the adoption of the report on Knopfos Kral. Uh, consideration and the adoption of the second term committee program. <clears throat> the briefing on the, the APP and strategic plans of 2023-2024 financial year. Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment and MLRF. South African National Parks and East Mangaliso. Wednesday, tomorrow, again from half past 10 to five, continuation of the briefings. It will be Source and Sunbi. Recording in progress. Uh, this weekend from the 21st, we are descending to the Eastern Cape for public, public consultations on climate change. On Tuesday the 2nd, the, part, the beat is a, what is that? Con, uh, consideration and adoption of the committee budget report, budget vote report, <clears throat> briefing by the PGA. Chilis, am I right to assume that uh, members have interfaced with this document? Yes, Chair, I did share it in our group. So in the interest of time, can I just see if members want to add or subtract anything so that we don't go uh, column by column? Hey, person. Honorable Paulson. Um, are we dealing with the Knoflox cow matter, correct? You are correct, yes. Uh, Chairperson, yeah. So there's a part there that says that um, other members argued that homeless and landless people in the Western Cape of Africa should find land anywhere in Occupier. They said that the police must keep law and order and prevent evictions and those denying people the birthright of a place to stay. Now, Chairperson, um, oh, in the main, I'm happy with the document, but I think in fairness to the other members who may have a different feeling, I'd like it to be on record that it wasn't other members it was the EFF that argued that homeless and landless people in the Western Cape and South Africa should find land anywhere in occupied. So if that um, addition could be made to the document, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. No, no, it's fine, Honorable Paulson. Uh, we will come to Knofos Kral. I thought you were... Uh removing it on the program for the oh. Oh, yeah. oh okay no no um, i know the program i'm also fine with okay okay Let, let's just finalize the program uh, i thought you were removing mm -hmm. it from the 
that you were making an addition to that yeah. part. You want the report to just recognize that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The EFF. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. We'll, we'll get to it when we discuss the, the report. Okay, Che. Okay, let's go down, Chilis. It would seem uh, we'll be seized with the climate change bill for the better part of the term. Is there anything that uh, honorable members think that we might have left out? Sorry, Chair, I'm not sure if, if uh, the hands are coming up on your side. I saw Honorable Mkuna also had one up at one stage. Um, I do have my hand up as well. I can only see yours. Okay, now now, now it's fine, okay. Honorable Brian. Before, before you okay. proceed, uh, may I request Simon to switch his mic off? Simon, please switch your mic off. Okay, Honorable Brian, please proceed now. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, uh, there's just two items that I would request um, that uh, we, we put on the agenda if possible. The one is the long outstanding um, discussion around the animal welfare bill and uh, the joint collaboration between the uh, our committee and the uh, Dalrad committee. Uh, we have had numerous previous meetings on that, um, but I think it would be important for us to get an update um, as to uh, that collaboration between the two committees. So that would be on a, a, a uh, we'd, we'd need to invite um, Dalrad uh, uh, committee to, to join that. That's the one request, Chair. And the other request is um, a report that we haven't received yet, um, which is uh, on scientific activities uh, in Antarctica. I know the minister uh, did embark on a trip there a couple of uh, months back. And for us to have a presentation on the existing um, uh, activities uh, from a scientific perspective taking place in Antarctica. Uh, those, are, those are my requests for, for the, the two items uh, uh, for the agenda at, at some stage. Uh, they shouldn't uh, take too much time, so I'm sure we could slot them in if possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Bryant. If you allow us, can we just put them as footnotes for now? Um, and then at the right time, we'll find a proper and suitable date and squeeze them in the agenda. Perfect, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Honorable members, it's your opportunity to make further uh, inputs on the term of, on the program for the term. Honorable Ganjo. Thank you, Chair. I think, Chair, we need also to find space for Auditor General. Uh, we have agreed on their request to be to not present today's meeting today's meeting but however we'll have to then try and feature them in on this program thank you chairperson okay <clears throat> we'll include that also as a footnote um can we then move for the adoption with those footnotes those items honorable members have proposed will will find a suitable date for them uh, so, so, but they should not uh, come as surprises. Uh, they are part of this, uh, this uh, second term program. The two matters raised by Honorable Bryant and the matter of uh, Honorable uh, Gancho. Can we then move, can we get a, a mover? Honorable Mkunu. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, I move for, for the adoption of the program with those additions on the footnotes. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Mkunu moves for the adoption with those additions. Honorable Winkler. I second that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Winkler. Um, Right, uh, we now move honorable members to
Honor Mesta Rademeyer. Mr. whose phone is ringing, it's not ringing. Uh, good morning, Mr. Rademeyer. Welcome to a meeting of the Portfolio Committee of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. I want to, on behalf of this committee, thank you very much for having the courage to write a book on such a contentious issue uh, that, may, that many people would shy away from publishing. Um, one wonders whether your publication has evoked strong reactions, um, uh, whether positive or negative up to, the, to this end, and where such reactions might be coming from, it's a matter that needs to be thoroughly looked at. Uh, secondly, I would like to, to think that while researching for your book, you might have came across uh, experiences from other countries of what ultimately happens uh, to protected areas subjected to this kind of things uh, that you might have came across in the Kruger National Park. And uh, I'm sure members of this community would gladly like to hear from you of those experiences. Without further ado, I invite you to present to the Portfolio Committee of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. Once again, welcome. Thank you, Honourable Chair, and thank you, Honourable Members. Um, it's a privilege to be here, and I, I greatly appreciate the, the invitation. Um, I'd like to present uh, on a report that was published earlier this year um, and the findings of that particular report. If you bear with me for one second, let me just get a PowerPoint up. If you can see that. Yes, we can. The landscape of fear, All right. crime, and murder. Thank you. All right. So um, just to briefly, before I, before I get started, explain the, the alphabet soup to the right of the screen. Um, I, I work for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, it's a civil society organization which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. It's been in existence for around 10 years, working on issues of organized crime uh, around the world. Uh, we have around 100 staff in various observatories. I head up our East and Southern Africa Observatory. Uh, there are two other African observatories, one in West Africa, one in North Africa and the Sahel. We're also supported by uh, an expert group of around 500 people drawn from academia, law enforcement, uh, judiciary and, and uh, the development worlds. Um, and the global initiative on this particular project is partnered with the Institute of Security Studies and Interpol. That partnership uh, sees the, uh, the work done by the Enact Africa project. And the Enact Africa project is implemented by those groups to try and uh, build knowledge and develop skills to enhance the continent's abilities to combat organized crime. Um, and it's, it's funded by the European Union, which has placed security in Africa um, high up on its agenda uh, through its Pan-African program. So now that we've got that out of the way, uh, let me move on to the presentation itself. Um, we'll be speaking today a lot about crime. And I think that it's what we tried to do with this report, what I tried to do with this report, was to take a step back from the focus area around Kruger and poaching on Kruger. Um, so much has been written over the years by myself included where there's been a very narrow focus on, on the Kruger National Park, the poaching that's occurring within the Kruger uh, issues around the so-called war on poaching. Um, and I think that what we set out to do here was to take a step back, look at Mpumalanga holistically and look at some of the issues in Mpumalanga, um, a province that is uniquely situated in South Africa, given its, its um, access to various borders, uh, given the fact that it surrounds the southern part of the, of the park and the so-called intensive protection zone where uh, many of the park's last rhino populations are left. Um, the first slide there is a, a slide that was taken, an image taken from uh, an armed robbery at a business mall in Bushbuck Ridge. And you're probably wondering why I'm putting that up, but I think that it, exemplifies in many ways the challenges that we're dealing with in Mpumalanga, but also the challenges that we're dealing with in organized crime more broadly in South Africa. Uh, this was an incident in February this year, 
Uh, the police issued a press statement the following day saying that there'd been an incident uh, in which uh, a number of suspects had caused a stir uh, during a business robbery at the Dwarslip Mall in Bushbuck Ridge. It was only a few paragraphs down that you learned that there were 30 armed suspects carrying handguns and rifles who stormed the mall in the early hours of the morning, used explosives to gain access to cash and safes, blew up ATM machines, attacked a casino and blew up uh, slot machines in that casino, raided a PEP home store and a PEP clothing store, raided a liquor store and a cell phone store and made off. Uh, the police station in that area is seven kilometers away from where this incident occurred. Um, keeping with that long view of, of crime, um, and I think that the most important aspect here, and this is looking at South Africa, uh, and this is extracted, by the way, from our strategic organized crime assessment on South Africa, which I've made available to the committee, along with the, the report that I'm speaking about. Um, we've always had high levels of violence in South Africa. But what's important to note here is that um, our first democratic elections in 1994 saw a dramatic reduction in murder rates. Some of that can be attributed to the so-called peace dividend uh, in, in the moments after the election, um, as some of the violence that had been raging for a number of years across the country uh, dissipated, but also the implementation of things like the Firearms Control Act, which and and which was at the time you had um, a, uh, a high functioning central firearms registry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that saw nearly 50 percent decline in murder, and we use murder because it's an accurate way of assessing levels of violence within within a society. Around 2011-12, we begin to see an uptick in those figures across the country, and then a 38% increase in murder rates across South Africa in 10 years. It's closer to a 40% increase by now. Um, much of that's been attributed to law enforcement institutional weaknesses. There's also an increase in vigilante action in many communities uh, that are grappling with organized crime and issues around armed robbery, and where all too often law enforcement is absent or, or ineffective. Um, and it's also key in terms of things like violent robbery, but as I'll mention later, issues around cash and transit heists, ATM bombings, and so on and so forth. Now, what sets in Pumalanga apart in some ways is that it is one of the, the few rural provinces that has Mr. seen... Rademir? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, can. yes, yes we, can, we, can, we can. We can hear you. I think it might be an issue with the chairperson's signal. Okay. I'll just pause for a second there. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? We can hear you, in Mr. Radevlo. We will okay, make in the, the, in, the in, All right. In the interest of time, I'll continue. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so if we look at, at uh, Mpumalanga, it's in a, in a fairly unique position among provinces in South Africa, where it's seen a 42% increase in motor rates over 10 years. That, uh, as you can see, Gauteng, uh, which is particularly high rates in, in violent crime, has also seen a 42% increase over that period. And those provinces, the Western Cape, 46%, uh, and KwaZulu-Natal are the, are the two highest, um, which is, is quite worrying if you consider that, you know, Mpumalanga is, um, is, is in that cluster of provinces with such high levels of violent crime. But another aspect which is very important to, to mention, and the slide is quite convoluted, I'm not going to go into too much detail, other than to emphasize that South Africa is in the unique position among African countries. And this is measured in um, a uh, organized crime index, which we produce uh, globally every two years, and an Africa index, which we produce together with the ENACT project, um, where we try to measure levels of organized crime across countries, but we also try to measure the levels of resilience within those countries. Um, and what, what, is, what this research shows, and you can have a look at the, the document itself, is that South Africa is in a unique position. While our resilience is growing increasingly fragile, we still have comparatively high levels of resilience compared to most African countries. Uh, but we also have extremely high levels of, of criminality. And... 
connected criminal markets, uh, where you have a range of activities from sort of mafia-style groups to issues around smuggling of arms, uh, human trafficking, human smuggling, um, our, our linkages into the international drugs trade, and obviously issues around wildlife crime. Within that context, um, the Kruger, and that's the, the, the study area of this report in the map on the right there, uh, from Acorn Hook down and then across to, to Kamati Port with some, some extension into the Barberton area. Um, the Kruger exists in what, what we've termed uh, a landscape of fear, and we argue that the gravest threat face, facing the Kruger National Park and the greater Kruger area today is not poaching, but internal corruption. But it's important not to just focus only on the corruption. It's the drivers of corruption that we need to look at. And I'll come back to those. But also the criminal networks that have become entrenched in and around that area um, over the years. And much of that has to do with, with uh, the issues around law enforcement that I highlighted earlier. Um, so the Kruger is not some kind of insulated wildlife paradise. And I think any you know, all of you on this call know that. Um, but I think that... For many people out there, it seems to, it fits that mold. Um, and the struggles that it's, it's dealing with mirrors South Africa's broader struggles with organized crime. Um, the Kruger exists in a rapidly urbanizing landscape where criminal economies and violent local and transnational networks are embedded and evolving. Um, you can see that with kidnapping networks, cash and transit heists, drug trafficking that, that transits through there. Uh, human smuggling, um, ATM bombings. We've seen an uptick in assassinations, which I'll come back to. There's deep-seated inequality, and I'll touch on that in a bit more detail. Um, and, and crime and corruption have a profound impact on the greater Kruger region and the people who live in it and around the park. And that includes the Kruger National Park, uh, the Kruger staff. Um, the Kruger employs around 2,500 staff. It supports around 4,500 jobs in communities around the park. Uh, there are 400 field rangers, 86% of them live in villages and towns around the park. And they're particularly vulnerable in, in, that, in that way because there is, uh, you know, aside from the risks that they face within the park in, in trying to deal with, with poaching and, and um, other issues related to that, when they go home, they're also vulnerable to approaches from criminal networks. Um, and there are very few places for people to turn. Uh, you know, if you spent your 23 days on, you head home, uh, you have criminal networks making direct approaches and sometimes, you know, not even subtle approaches saying, for instance, you know, when you're not here and you're working in the park, we know where your children go to school and we know where your wife is um, and putting immense pressure on people. Um, we've seen that uh, organized crime certainly poses an existential threat to communities in that area, and that's particularly related to the violence, and we come back to the murder rate. But we've also seen uh, worrying issues, you know, for instance, the, the murder of a German tourist at Numbi Gate, the subsequent shootings of two security guards who were put in uh, position there to keep an eye on that entrance. We've seen the murder of Anton Mzimba, uh, the head ranger at Tundavati, uh, whose murder has yet to be resolved, despite the fact that there are leads on suspects. Uh, we've seen the murder of Colonel Leroy Brevere, uh, who was assassinated while investigating rhino poaching networks in the Kruger National Park. Again, no one has been uh, charged, or I mean, no one has been tried for that crime. Um, and we've seen other murders more recently. I mentioned the case of, of Chief Clyde Amnesi, uh, who was implicated in involvement in, uh, in networks involved in poaching and organized crime around the Kruger National Park. Um, and the subsequent ass uh, assassination, it seems to be in a, an internal family dispute, but the subsequent assassination murder of his, of his widow. Um, so all of those complexities come, come together. Um, so if we look at this issue, and I've turned it a governance void, where you have a growing community living in and around the Kruger National Park. You have around 2.9 million people within 50 kilometers of the Kruger's boundary fence, according to Statis in 2019. That figure is probably likely closer to 4 million today. Average unemployment's around 46%. Um, and uh, you know, in research that's been done around the park, the Kruger's aesthetic beauty, while it might appeal to tourists, has very little relevance to communities living around that park and, and living in conditions where they are struggling. 
Um, the Kruger itself is struggling with a historic legacy that molded over a century. We can go back to the impact of Afrikaner nationalism, apartheid, forced removals around there, structural racism, which continues to bedevil efforts to, to try and remold and restructure the park. Stan Parks has worked hard in trying to attract Black South African tourists to the park. But the simple fact remains that Black South Africans make up 28% of all Sand Parks guests, and they only make up around 12% of overnight guests in that park. Um, poverty, inequality, unemployment are key drivers of crime. Uh, we've seen areas, again, as I say, where there's an absence of law enforcement, either because law enforcement is disinterested, too corrupt, or too inefficient, where there's an absence of, of uh, real change in communities. Um, and that has an impact and it, it allows for the uh, for criminal networks to entrench themselves, but it also allows for parallel illicit economies uh, to grow and metastasize. And there's also um, instances where communities have been tarred as poachers, uh, where they are subject to heavy handed anti poaching operations, which itself has has led to deeper divisions. Um, if we look at the impact, and I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but between 2011 and 2020, the Kruger's right, white rhino population fell by 75%. What we've seen in the Kruger is this low level, seemingly unending so-called war on poaching as it's all too often erroneously termed. Um, and But if you look at it within that context, this is a 15 year low level conflict. This is as long as the wars of independence in Angola and Mozambique uh, the Bush War in Rhodesia, or the Lebanese Civil War. Um, the military strategy uh, is has been largely unsuccessful. We've seen declining populations. We've seen continued poaching. Um, it's come at enormous psychological and, and physical impact. There's been a severe breakdown in trust, staff cohesion, and professionalism within the park as a result. You know, for instance, when you're seeing millions being spent on uh, this nebulous war on poaching, and yet the facilities in which rangers have to live are not being improved. That has a significant impact on, on morale. Um, there are well-founded fears that there are significantly high levels of corruption within the park. Some people speculate around 40% of staff may be involved in some way, um, either by uh, assisting syndicates with information or more directly, uh, smuggling weapons into the park, that kind of thing. We know that in one section of the park, at least 14 out of 20 rangers have been implicated in corruption. Um, a financial investigation and, uh, and, a, and an impressive financial investigation, which has been done by DPCI, supported by KPMG, the auditing firm, uh, through donor funding, bringing in Sand Parks and Kruger investigators, plus also bringing in the NPA, has identified around 50 suspects so far. Um, and it's an investigation which unfortunately at the moment doesn't have funding to continue, but it has resulted in 16 arrests. And those 16 arrests have had a, a, a had an almost overnight impact in driving down poaching. And one in one particular area of the park where some of the early arrests took place, there was not a poaching incident for three months. Um, I think it's fair to say, and certainly we we make this point in the report that there is a refreshing openness within the Kruger, but also within sand parks to, uh, to speak out about issues that they are, are, that they are confronting with corruption. Uh, there are efforts underway to try and uh, root out corruption and, and most importantly, to rebuild fractured relationships within the park. But it's something that is going to take um, a very, very long time. Uh, and it's going to take a degree of, of commitment. I'll come a lot back to that further. Um, if you look at it, and we've termed this the Wild East, um, it's a, it's a, a comment that uh, was a statement taken from a book about organized crime in Mpumalanga. Um, <clears throat> Mpumalanga's violence and its geographic position set it apart. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, it's, it's uh, position in relation to Mozambique and Eswatini. Uh, we've mentioned the various types of crimes that are, are occurring increasingly often there. Uh, there are criminal syndicates with tentacles that extend to a range of markets. It's not a case where you have syndicates involved in rhino poaching only, but you have syndicates with uh, linkages into cash and transit heists, the taxi industry, other forms of violence. Uh, the late Chief Clyde and Nisi is a good example of that. It's believed his, his assassination was linked to 
um, a dispute over the spoils from a cash and transit heist. He also was involved in the taxi industry. And he um, has been, uh, he was arrested and was due to go on trial this month on charges linked to an extensive uh, rhino poaching syndicate, which also involved um, Petro Sidney Mabuza, um, a, a significant crime boss, uh, better known by his clan name, Mshengu. Uh, he was assassinated in June 2021. That's his vehicle, the orange pickup truck there. Another figure in that syndicate is Joseph Nyalunga on the bottom right. Uh, a former police officer. And there are a number of former police officers who've been implicated in this case, five of them, including the former station commissioner from Skukusa. So that gives you in a snapshot a, a fairly um, a good idea of, of how these syndicates operate and how they traverse different markets. Corruption remains a key enabler of all of this activity. Um, and I've spoken earlier about uh, some of the assassinations and in Pumalanga, certainly in our most recent report documenting assassinations in South Africa, has seen alarming upticks in assassinations uh, related to organized crime, but also uh, politically. Uh, we come to responses, second last slide. Um, we've looked at this and this is not, does not only apply to the Kruger and the greater Kruger area, but I think in many approaches to, to organized crime in South Africa. Um, policing tactics have for the most part been reactive. Uh, and need to be replaced. We need much more strategic approaches, targeted investigations. Uh, the investigation, for instance, that was done by DPCI and Pumalanga, coupled with the NPA, Sand Parks, and KPMG is one example of that. And the impact of that investigation, and hopefully we'll go forward and see convictions coming from that, um, has, been, has been incredibly encouraging. Uh, targeted investigations, identifying high-level actors in the markets that cause the greatest harms. We've seen, for instance, a good example is the case of Big Joe Nyalunga, who's allegedly uh, one of the key figures linked to, to a significant network, poaching network, where action, and he's been arrested three times in connection with poaching cases and has also been arrested in connection with a murder, um, where action has been taken not only through prosecutions that are, are coming up now, but also where the South African Revenue Service um, has become involved and hit him with a tax bill. Uh, a significant tax bill, plus uh, most of his assets have been seized. Uh, so coupling asset forfeiture with, uh, with tax investigations and others. Um, it's necessary to build up critical financial investigations and intelligence functions within SAPs, but also strategically within DPCI. Uh, DPCI have demonstrated in the province that they can make inroads into organized crime. We've seen that with some of the investigations into cash and transit heists but also more recently with the Kruger investigations. Prosecutions of high-level actors and speedy prosecutions. Um, and then, very importantly, within the park, rebuilding morale, rebuilding professionalism and trust among staff and rangers, providing protections for whistleblowers, investigators and prosecutors. And I think that with the, the current leadership in, in, San, in, in, in the Kruger, there are um, efforts underway to do that. Um, but that is going to require a long-term commitment from political leadership, from Sandparks and its board, to address those issues uh, in a way that's transparent, fair, swift, and consistent. Um, it's also vital, and there again moves underfoot within Kruger to do this, to implement a transparent and fair integrity management policy. And that is an integrity management policy that goes far beyond simply doing uh, polygraphing uh, with, with all the attendant contributors controversy around that. And importantly, rebuilding a sense of professionalism, trust, uh, and motivation by embedding core values at both the leadership level, but also among staff. I think it's important that this is not something that's seen to be targeting staff only, but that it's something that works across the park um, and, and leadership are bound to, to the same levels of, of and, and are bound to the, to the same uh, processes. Um, there's a need to improve internal communications and to provide ways for staff, particularly rangers, to, to speak out about some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, I've mentioned strategy, um, the possibility of amnesties for low-level actors, uh, again, a controversial idea, but one that should at least be explored. And then creating safe spaces and an independent whistleblowing mechanism. Um, I think that is probably the greatest challenge, and, and it's the one that is going to require the most thought, um, particularly when you have situations where your staff are vulnerable within the park, but also outside the park, 
where you have cases, for example, where you have criminal networks who double as loan sharking or double, you know, as loan sharks uh, involved in a range of criminal access, uh, of activities, which can give them access to people's financial information through loans, cash loans, um, and that also pinpoints weaknesses. Um, so I think I think there are a number of of areas where uh, where there can be significant improvements made. Um, I think in many ways the the greatest weakness currently in the in the province is policing within many of the communities that are impacted and the absence of of police and the police themselves in some of those communities face the same challenges as Sand Park's Ranger Corps, where they are exposed, they live in communities that they are meant to police, they're exposed to entrenched organized crime networks and uh, and syndicates. So ultimately, the takeaway for me from, from, this, uh, from this particular research, um, and as I've said earlier, the, the report has been circulated, is that there is only so much that can be done within the Kruger Park. Um, and I think that there are, are commendable efforts uh, underway at the moment. Hopefully, we'll see uh, positive results coming from those. But there is an urgent need to address the far more broad uh, issue of, of organized crime within the Kruger, which stretches from Barberton and the mines of Barberton, and the linkages between those networks. And it's not something that only the DPCI or the NPA can tackle. Um, it's something that is going to require an all of government commitment. It needs, it, it requires issues to, around um, the socioeconomic conditions in the province to be addressed urgently, um, and then uh, a, a broader involvement from, from law enforcement agencies. Um, I thank you uh, if there are any questions at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Redemir. Thank you. Thank you very much for a comprehensive uh, report. Uh, honorable members, can I invite you to engage the presentation of Mr. Redemir? I know the hand of Honorable Weber. I also know the hand of Honorable Bryant. Uh, please proceed, Honorable Weber. We'll see if there are other hands that, um, that may come a bit later. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rademeyer, for an excellent report. I think we all are a little bit shocked and maybe, well, not shocked, I'm not shocked, but paralyzed by the information due to the fact that um, we do not have proper enforcement of of dealing with these issues. You just mentioned now from the mines in Barberton right through now, I live in Mpumalanga. So one of the big issues in Barberton town in itself is corrupt not only by these wildlife, but also by the mines, which no one can do anything about. So it's like you said, a parallel, I'm not sure you called it a parallel, but it is a parallel, um, so like a shadow uh, mining companies. They do exactly what a legal one do. They just parallel to them. And this is exactly what is happening. You mentioned that um, there was <laughs> a fall of 75% of run within the Kruger National Park. So this is a very interesting question I'm going to ask, which I'm not sure you can answer, but what is the real figure of existing rhinos in, 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 the, in the Kruger? It is also scary to see, and I understand it, if someone comes to you and says they're going to kill your wife or your child, they do that to a policeman and to a ranger, which really cares. They really don't really have anywhere to go because they must go to a policeman that they thought that is um, on their side and they're not, and they lose, they do lose of this. What can really be done about that? I, I, I saw you say that there's 16 people arrested my problem is you said there's also no funding. Who's responsible for the funding if you're going to um, a court case and is it the investigation that needs to be done by the police that is needs funded? Why is there no funding for this investigation so we can, can, can actually have some serious convictions here? I think one of the big problems here is also the, 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 the crossover from, 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 from uh, provinces. Um, because in Skakuza court, I quite often go to that. And that is my other question. You mentioned that the station Kumara has also been arrested or being implicated. We said with Skakuza court, that is mostly in the Bushback Ridge area, exactly where you had this, um, this, this, this um, 
30 uh, mass people going in and blew up everything. Um, so Skukuza court is there. If the station commander is implicated and the Skukuza court takes place in Skukuza, how fair can these outcomes be? Um, I've attended some of them. I've seen some be arrested. I see, see some people really just they just walk out. And because the system of the cross border, someone that has been implicated twice or three arrested in KZN and they come over to, to Kruger National Park in Pumalanga, there's no reference from that situation and they walk three years as a first timer. Um, how can we maybe uh, better that situation between all of the provincial um, environmental people? Then just my last question, I think, let me just make sure. No, I think for now that is it. Thank you. Uh, just my last question. Um, when you speak about the socioeconomic conditions and 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 um, is it that you mean about the inequality and the poverty of people and therefore they're vulnerable to the syndicate crime, uh, to the crime syndicates in the sense of they will do anything to sort of get money in betraying what is, uh, uh, what is happening there? Then my question, if that is what you mean, is how can you lift up the socioeconomic uh, 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 problems if the country has such a high rate of poverty and unemployment, and one of the reasons we're there is because of this syndicate crime um, and the corruption that we have in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, Honourable Chair, should I answer those questions quickly? Or? Chair Person, are you there? Uh, I think we normally, sorry, I think the Chair has dropped off again. We normally take a couple, so I'll, I'll take the liberty, I think, in the meantime of just following on. Um, thank you again, Mr. Rodemeyer, um, just to echo the sentiments of uh, my colleague, uh, Honourable Weber. Um, very, very interesting presentation, and uh, I think it's it's uh, sort of a missing piece of the puzzle in terms of many of the presentations that we've had up until now, um, really speaking to some of those key endemic issues um, uh, in terms of, you know, what's, what's, what's feeding uh, this, this broader network of crime uh, in the Mpumalanga area. We have been up ourselves as a committee uh, to visit Kruger and uh, some of the things that you've mentioned, um, I think are quite pertinent uh, in terms of our own oversight operations um, up there. Um, one question that I that I would like to to ask: we we've heard recently uh, reports, in particular around load shedding and ESCOM. Um, there was a report, I think it was in the Daily Maverick, uh, speaking uh, around the connections with the coal mafia in Mpumalanga and spoke to similar uh, networks, uh, including cash and transit. And I think they mentioned Rhino Horn as well um, and the connections with uh, Mr. Mabuza. Um, uh, I'm talking about uh, Mr. Big uh, Mabuza, uh, the other one, um, the, the, the gent who was, uh, who was assassinated. Um, how uh, much uh, of a link is there between uh, what's taking place with the coal mafia uh, in that area and important political figures and 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 uh, I know the police uh, certain police uh, uh, individuals were were implicated as well uh, in, in some of those reports. Uh, how much of a connection is there between that coal mafia um, and the uh, issues relating to rhino uh, horn smuggling and the poaching? Um, then in terms, you mentioned uh, there were issues with, uh, with what you referred to as heavy-handed anti-poaching operations. Um, can you just expand a little bit on what, you, uh, what you're referring to there? Um, uh, uh, in terms of the range of facilities uh, and you know, how we could be improving those uh, with some of the money that's being spent on the war and fully agree with you. I mean, we were up there, uh, uh, as I mentioned, on that oversight, and I know many of the members were quite shocked to see some of the conditions that some of the, the, the rangers uh, were, were staying in. Um, it was good to see that there were, some of them were being upgraded, but there was still a long way to go. Um, and you know, I don't think anybody wants to be spending this money. That said, we are still sitting uh, with 82 vacant ranger posts uh, at Kruger National Park. Only five of them have been 
managed to to to, to be filled uh, by sandbox of, over the past year um and there's still another 82 that need to be filled and they need budget and all of that as well so that is a challenge and obviously where would you where would you house them with the with the current issues they're facing uh where can we get that report that you mentioned from usa and wwf is that available online um or if it's not is it something that could be circulated to the committee is it a confidential report uh, if you could just expand on that um i think you've you've made the point quite clear in terms of the breakdown of trust between sand parks and Kruger national park and staff etc i know it's something that which we've raised on a regular basis we sometimes met with a you know oh don't worry everything's everything's okay we're, we're working on it but i think there there is blatantly uh it, an issue there and, and I know it's been it's been raised when we've spoken previously around polygraph testing or integrity testing and trying to find ways to get that balance correct between treating everybody like a criminal but recognizing the fact that there is endemic corruption taking place in Kruger National Park and I think that balance is important and I think following on from that what you mentioned your responses which I think could probably be better summed up as recommendations um, at the end of your report, have you made those formally to any members of uh, of, of Sandbox, the board, or, or any of the staff? And if so, uh, what has the response been uh, in terms of those recommendations? And the final point is you've mentioned your work with ISS and Interpol. Um, how much uh, uh, work is being undertaken in terms of the end point? Uh, of of a lot of this uh, rhino horn, the vast majority of it going to China, um, and the connection between our local smuggling syndicates and the uh, uh, Chinese buyers and the Chinese criminal syndicates um, that are operating and functioning, um, and what more, in your opinion, could be done by the South African government and Sandbox and our police to address that? Thank you again. Thank you very much, Honorable Bryant, Honorable Ganjo. <clears throat> Thank you, Chaperson. I will request that I switch off my video because I've just experienced load shedding started now at 10 um, for the connectivity. Uh, I would like to switch off my video. Uh, Chair, just to two points uh, from the report by Mr. Rademe. Let me appreciate the report. And uh, one, he has mentioned some of the allegations about the uh, employees of um, Sun Parks or Kruger National Park who are involved in these uh, crimes. I want to check if there they are concrete evidence and also if those are uh, allegations have been reported to the police and they have been charged. And um, secondly, Chair, we, it is clear here that we are not just dealing with um, the killing of animals and so on and so forth, but you are dealing with a, a, a syndicate. We are dealing with organized crime that deals with drugs, as, as he has already mentioned, uh, human trafficking and all that. That, 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 that. So for me, I think it is not only uh, us as, as, as a DFFE that needs to deal with this matter. We need, or, or sand packs, we need to rope in um, the safety and security class um, so that we can all work together in, try to in trying to resolve this matter. So I would propose that as this committee, we at some point we have to call um, um minister Ukele and uh, the portfolio committee that deals with uh, 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 yeah the safety and security uh, cluster to come and we afford also um, Mr. Rada may an opportunity to present this so that we can hear from the side of the police what is it that they are doing in trying to assist um, the challenges that are faced uh, by Mpumalanga and, and, and the community at large. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson. Sebulele, uh, Honorable Kancho, Honorable Mbata. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Julian. 
I think uh, you have been touched on the, the local strategies, <coughs> uh, community safety, like the your, your CPF, uh, your, the street committees, if there are street committees, because it's a rural area, uh, on how best uh, uh, this can be um, controlled and uh, what other assistance, because let me just give a reference on where I'm staying. We have a lot of crime, um, but what, what we do, we did as a community. We, we decided to get one uh, security company where all the community members agreed to use that security company. And each house, they pop about 300 and something, 335. So, for all the crime, because it was the, the, we had the highest crime, for all the crime here, whether there's uh, deliveries uh, and so forth, these security companies, they are accompanying those people and uh, they have the cameras also for surveillance around the, the, the street. And we've got the street committees, uh, uh, which hold their own meetings with the, the, the relevant uh, security company. So for that, we, uh, we have seen that our crime has, um, has uh, gone down because there was housebreaking. Kids couldn't go even to the shops. Uh, so I, I was, I, I'm just uh, giving uh, some of those information to say, maybe you should also check on, 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 on uh, making sure that the community buy in and they, they pop out to assist because sometimes the police, they are not available 24 seven, but this security company is available 24 seven. They've got the surveillance cameras in all the streets where in our area, because we tried our level best to try and reduce or resolve the issue of crime. And it has, it has an impact now. And we have so many cases where we have, the, as the community, we have, a, a, uh, found ourselves the the the, the culprits. And then after, we, uh, by the assistant of the security company, and we have handed over, uh, uh, handed uh, them over to the uh, local police stations. I know it's a difficult situation, but please try and look at those uh, small and issues. That that means that the the community is buying in now, so it will assist a lot. Thank you. Honorable members, are there further takers? Uh, okay, Mr. Rademeyer, just uh, from my side, um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure you'd agree with me that uh, the, the triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and uh, uh, unemployment are significant uh, contributors and drivers uh, of crime. Um, uh, and this, this should include in, in those national parks. Uh, now, uh, in terms of your research um, um, and everywhere else you have been, how do these other national parks survive in, in, in other countries? Uh, just for example, here next to us in, in Zimbabwe, um, how, how do they survive? Or, or, or is it safe to conclude that we are the only country that is poor? Uh, it will be very helpful to, for us to uh, copy the, the working modalities uh, and the methodologies that they are, that they are that they are deploying there. <clears throat> but, but lastly, uh, the recommendations that you are making uh, to deal with this crime uh, in line with what Honorable Ganjo has proposed, uh, have you shared them with the law enforcement agencies, particularly the South African police services uh, to, en to enhance their effectiveness? Um, if you have, what has been their response uh, before we really intervene as a committee to invite the um, uh, uh, minister and uh, the leadership of South African uh, police services. Uh, over to you, Mr. Rademeyer. 
All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me start just quickly with that with that question. We did share the report. In fact, it was launched in White River uh, at, an, at a closed event attended by DPCI from the province, uh, Stan Parks and the NPA, um, along with other stakeholders. Um, we've also shared, and I think it, it overlaps quite a bit with, with this report, um, the strategic organized crime assessment that we've done at a national level with the Cyber Police Service, uh, DPCI, and also the, the relevant ministers uh, in, the, in the justice cluster, um, the MPA as well. Um, this particular report hasn't been shared nationally, but the, I think that many of the, the points that we're making in terms of strategic uh, interventions are, are raised in those in those other reports, um, but I, I think that there is certainly scope for for a further discussion debate there. Um, I think when it comes to other national parks, um, it's extremely difficult. Zimbabwe, you mentioned Zimbabwe. Yes, uh, Zimbabwe has been showing some success, but their national parks have also been under enormous pressure over the years. You know, facing. Uh, long before South Africa's poaching crisis began, Zimbabwe itself was was facing an onslaught on, on national parks. And that's ebbed and waned um, over the years. I think that the distinct characteristic that possibly sets us aside, certainly in Southern Africa, um, not so much in, in Central and, and other parts of Africa, but in Southern Africa, is the levels of violence that exist in our society and the levels of violent crime that exist in our society. Um, you know, the, the assassinations that take place. Not a week goes by without another assassination being reported. I've mentioned the upticks in, in Pumalanga and elsewhere. And I think that is what's really worrying, is that these syndicates, uh, you know, you're looking at cash and transit gangs, you're looking at illegal miners in the Barberton area, you're looking at people involved in a range of criminal activities and very violent criminal activities, have entrenched themselves and have metastasized. And you have these almost parallel economies that have become established, um, where the people that you turn to uh, in some communities are not necessarily the state for support, but you, you know, if you need a loan, if you need support, you turn to the gang bosses. If you need security, if you need protection of your business. Um, and that's really worrying. You know, we've seen that in other provinces too, the Western Cape around, um, you know, with with, with the, the gang economies. Um, so I think that, you know, that for, for us, that is something of very real concern, particularly in a province like Mpumalanga, where you've had this increase in, in, in murder rates over the past decade. Um, if I may, moving on to some of the other questions, um, and I'll try and answer these as quickly as possible. Um, Honorable Weber, uh, referred to Barberton and what could be done in Barberton. Um, certainly, you can see the, the economic impact of, of illegal mining and, and uh, organized crime on, on the community there. Uh, the mines around Barberton have had some success, though, by bringing in external police investigators, both DPCI and also uh, uh, the police task team and other agencies from other provinces to conduct uh, investigations. Um, and that has led to a significant dip in, in illegal mining in those communities, and particularly in areas where there is uh, there are allegations of significant local police corruption and police aiding and abetting um, illegal miners. Um, the Skakuza court, just to clarify, um, the person who was arrested uh, was briefly the, the station commissioner at Skakuza, and then was subsequently moved. I, I speak under correction, but I think it was to Bushbuck Ridge. Um, and that's when the arrest took place. Um, but um, certainly, you know, I think we've seen um, efforts in the past to close down the Skakuza court. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Uh, I think there's, the Skakuza court itself has, has a high um, uh, level of convictions that have taken place and dedicated prosecutors who are, are working there. Um, I think that when... The, the challenge, and this, this dovetails with, with some of the other comments from uh, Honorable Bryant, but I think you know, the challenge is, is where do you invest your money? I think it's quite crucial within Kruger to, to look at the conditions in which rangers operate. I think that a lot of the breakdown in trust, a lot of what can be attributed to the, the general collapse of morale within the park can be attributed to the, the conditions in which uh, which rangers work, their accusations of racism um, that have been leveled uh, by some rangers. There certainly is, uh, you know, if you look at 
uh, from a from a perspective of sort of spatial apartheid, very little has changed in the way that structures run within Kruger. And I think there are now efforts to try and relook at those, to also look at ben to carry out benchmarking operations, to look at salaries and employment scales. Um, so that's slightly important. Um, the socioeconomic conditions, and this uh, also touches on what the honourable chairperson was saying now. Um, yes, the high rates of poverty do play into that, but we also know that you know. Um, they're just because people are poor doesn't make them criminals. Um, and I think the vast majority of people in those communities are not involved in criminal activity. The problem, though, is that uh, you do have a, a subset, and it's a powerful subset with access to weapons. You can instill fear in communities where there's very little option. You know, who do you turn to? Um, in a community when your local police station has been corrupted, when uh, you can't rely on police reacting uh, to, to, those, to those issues and where you're not seeing any real impacts uh, when arrests do take place or prosecutions take place or when investigations take place. Um, Honorable Bryant mentioned ESCOM, load shedding um, and links to the coal mafia. Um, in our experience, and certainly there are some indications of some elements from that are involved in the coal mafia, also involved in other organized crime, from cash and transit heists, some linkages to, to rhino horn trafficking networks, poaching networks. But we tend to uh, look at organized crime ecosystems within South Africa. And the argument that we make in our strategic organized crime risk assessment is that there are multiple overlapping criminal ecosystems. And it's not a case of people working these days primarily in one sort of illicit economy. Um, you know, for example, you'll have, Barberton's a good example where there was a crackdown on illegal mining, um, but where um, similarly with the decline in poaching levels in the south of the Kruger National Park, some poachers have, uh, have turned to providing protection for illegal miners. Um, there was an incident when I was doing research where a hunting rifle was used to fire shots at mine security, and there were there was some suspicion that that rifle may have emanated from from poachers. So these are constantly shifting illicit markets and new opportunities. You know, if you stop one axis of illicit income, people still need to earn an uh, earn an income. Um, I right. If we've got, there's also a couple of questions here um, <coughs> around. The vacant posts within uh, within sand parks. There is a strong argument to be made that currently is probably not the right time to be filling posts in sand parks until there's some stability. Uh, certainly, some of the subjects that I interviewed described the current working environment um, as toxic, um, and that that employing staff at this particular time before efforts to address that can gain ground uh, would itself um, be self defeating. Um, certainly, I think, again, one needs to, again, look at, at the conditions in which rangers work. Uh, you yourselves have visited the park and seen that and how that can be addressed. Um, the USAID report is an internal report uh, that was done for sand parks with support from WWF. Um, the, uh, the reports, the recommendations in our reports have been shared widely with sand parks uh, and with the, the Kruger National Park. Um, I believe that they have also been um, shared at board level. Um, then, uh, sorry, just moving on. I'm hopefully not missing too many questions here. Honorable Gansho asked if there's concrete evidence. Um, certainly in the investigation where there have been 16 arrests done, uh, the prima facie evidence is, is, seems quite overwhelming in terms of linkages, payments made to corrupt actors within the park by criminal networks, uh, bank accounts set up in the names of, of family members or in the names of children, uh, shelf companies. Uh, there's a lot that's been unraveled there. And certainly with the, with the early arrests that took place and that overnight decline in poaching, uh, where, it, where it dropped from fairly high levels to no incidents in three months, show that, that these kinds of operations can have an impact. Um, I think DPCI have been very involved in that process, and I think DPCI in the province have been very involved and collaborative with Sand Parks and with the Kruger National Park uh, and working on investigations, uh, along with the police stock theft unit. Um, 
and the SAP stop stock lift unit based within Kruger um, has also been very effective. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done in communities around the, the Kruger, uh, where we've seen this metastasizing of, of organized crime and, and other issues. Um, Honorable Lombardo raised a very important point around street committees uh, and security companies and, and communities taking on their own uh, levels of security and addressing those. And I think that that certainly is a vital component, um, particularly in, in areas where you have an absence of law enforcement. But there is also so, only so much that can be done. We've seen cases, for instance, where um, street committees are intimidated, uh, where, uh, you know, where you do have uh, violent criminal networks that are entrenched. Um, and they themselves, in many cases, might not have the same protections as you could have if you had a dedicated law enforcement focus uh, on targeted investigations, looking into the networks that are terrorizing communities. Um, but I do think that that is an important component. It's an important component everywhere in South Africa where people you know, have the ability to, to do that. Um, certainly not all communities can afford cameras and, and, and uh, security uh, guards uh, on patrol. Um, and that in itself raises a challenge and, and helps to deepen inequalities in many cases in South Africa. Um, I'm not sure if I've missed any other questions that were asked, Honourable Chair, but uh, if, if I have left you on out, please feel free to, to shout. Honourable Brian, followed by Honourable Zamini. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, there was just one or two things uh, that I think uh, just, just requiring a response on. Just, just the first one, I see you mentioned that the that USAID report was an internal report. I'm assuming that means that it is confidential and won't be, you won't be able to share that, uh, if you can just confirm that. Um, and then the one question that I did ask was in terms of Interpol's involvement and your uh, dealings in terms of feedback with regards to the Chinese markets and the Chinese yes. smuggling syndicates and how that feeds in. Um, and then just, just, just again on that point of the coal mafia, um, I mean, have you found or has there been any inference of the involvement of senior political figures um, in the horn trade in the same way as has been alleged with the coal mafia? Um, it is sad to hear. Secondly, in terms of the, this toxic work environment you mentioned at KMP, it is something we have heard previously um, and, and that needs to be addressed. And then just chairperson, uh, perhaps as an aside, um, I know Sandbox is on the meeting um, I wonder if they would want to to make a response um, after Mr. Rodema um, to to some of the issues that have been raised. Thanks. Thank you, Honourable Brian. Honourable Zamini. Thank you, thank you, Honourable Chair. I just want to make some follow up. If probably they were not mentioned, one. I don't see the analysis about the stealing of cars, because what actually happened of stealing of vehicles, what actually happened now is that now there's a lot of these chop chop shops, in particular of stealing the parts. To me, I think it is increasing because they are able to say that now the transportation of the full vehicles therefore is costly for them. Now they're dealing with, now with this thing of chop chop shops, where actually now they are selling directly the parts. So if maybe we can be able to get that kind of now of the analysis. The second one, on the health sector, these focus doctors that are taking place in doing operations to human bodies and all that, stealing the organs. Because now to some of other areas, you'll find that now they will rush on a question and they're working closely with the people on mortuaries where actually they steal this kind of an organs. For some of other people now, they don't want to do any post-mortem based on that thing that the organs are being stolen. The last point that is disturbing me uh, a little bit, Chair, under organized corruption, I'm not sure it's deliberate or it is not deliberate. Why is mentioned when we speak about corruption we speak about one person, the leader, and you even mentioned like Jacob Zuma. Is it not okay? Just simple say, corruption under the state capture, this is what actually happened. 
than now to single a person and by the name and say, in fact, now the person under this leadership of this person, as if in fact now corruption is started from his era. It didn't happen to any other things. I think it's find, I find it very much disturbing to me that now we can't be able to do and demoralize or demonic any person who's doing that kind of a thing. Therefore, I'm appealing to say that now this presentation, it should not be able to, to be personal. It should be able to be an overview that will be able to take place and make sure that now we talk about things that are happening than just to personalize it to any certain individual. It was going to be enough for me to say, under the state of state capture report or whatever it is, therefore you speak about reports, the name of people a lot have been mentioned on that state of report. But now I want to single it out. I find it very, very bad and disturbing to me. Thank you very much. Sabah, Honorable Zamin, Honorable Winkler. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to um, Mr. Rademeyer. I'd like to know, has there been any response by Sandpox um, and the department um, with regard to the report? Um, because I, I assume that this was sent to the various applicable authorities. Um, and has there been any consultation with yourself and these agencies um, on how we can collaborate in terms of the information that you've brought forward and propose solutions and whether the department and um, Sandpox has been willing to take these recommendations on board um, and perhaps uh, draft some sort of plan, um, a management plan to deal with this endemic corruption and uh, the numerous other issues that you have highlighted in the report. Thank you. Mr. Rademeyer. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, all right, let me just begin with Honorable Bryant. Um, yes, the report is is confidential. Um, so I think any, any inquiries in that are probably best uh, directed to Sandparks. With regard to the, the Chinese market, um, we, under this project, haven't recently done work. I've done quite extensive work myself over the past 10 years looking at linkages between rhino horn trafficking uh, in, in Africa and also in Asia, uh, notably Vietnam and China. Um, I would say that from the uh, that, you know, much of the market these days seems to be in China. Uh, Certainly, uh, there have been some efforts to do investigations. I think there's a lot more that could be done there. There has been some encouraging signs uh, in recent years, although disrupted somewhat by the pandemic, of collaboration uh, between South African and other law enforcement agencies and counterparts uh, in the People's Republic of China. Um, You've also asked if uh, high-level political officials uh, are implicated in uh, rhino poaching. Um, there are many allegations that do the rounds. Uh, hard evidence is hard to come by. Um, you know, there have been suggestions of some political figures at a, at a more lower level um, who are implicated in that. I, I think it's it's um, it's a tricky one to to assess, particularly given the the climate that one sees in a province like Mpumalanga, where you do have. Um, you know, for instance, the investigator and investigator in a significant rhino poaching case being assassinated. There is, you know, a, a climate of fear to some degree. And I think that there's a reluctance to probe too deeply um, very often when it comes to powerful figures. Um, so, you know, that, that in itself. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to a comparison sort of with the coal mafia and those linkages, uh, you know, probably um, not, not quite on the, on, on the same level. Um, if we move on, uh, Honorable Lamini, you mentioned the theft of cars and chop shops, certainly also an issue uh, in that province and the movement of cars across borders. Uh, one of the people allegedly involved in, uh, in a network that we profile in the report and is, who is due to stand uh, trial uh, soon, uh, a former police officer was also implicated in moving stolen vehicles uh, across the border, which um, allegedly was the reason for his uh, his leaving the police. Uh, we've also seen cases with vehicles moving, and I'm sure you, you're aware of these, of, of vehicles being moved across the border uh, through Eswatini. Um, 
I unfortunately know very little about uh, organ theft cases and and uh, uh, bogus doctors. So I'd, I'd be the wrong person to comment on that. Um, I think your concern, certainly uh, the question around naming people, um, I, I, I take what you mean there. And I think that certainly what the report tries to show is that issues that we're dealing with with corruption in Pumbalanga long predate the province even coming into, into existence. Uh, there's a section in the report which tries to trace to some degree the history and the challenges um, that Mpumalanga faces as a province and how you know some of the issues around corruption uh, that, that the province is still wrestling with today and the roots of that corruption um, predate the, the formation of Mpumalanga in 1994. Um, and date back to uh, apartheid homelands and other linkages and issues around uh, the the homeland police and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd be I I would refer you to that section of the report. I think that where we have also identified people by name in terms of criminal networks that have involved, I think that has been necessary in this report to try and extend ex to demonstrate the reach and the impact also that um, political figures have. Um, and issues that have occurred on their watch uh, on on the the growth and the spread of of organised crime um, and issues around law enforcement capacity to deal with that. Um, Honourable Winkler, um, uh, we've uh, have discussed the report with officials in the Kruger National Park. Certainly, Sand Parks um, issued a statement following the release of the report, report saying that they. They welcome the, uh, the, the findings of the report and the recommendations. Um, and, you know, in my experience, I've seen um, uh, a willingness, um, certainly a, a, a very encouraging willingness on the part of Sandparks to discuss these issues far more openly than in the past um, and, and a willingness to try and, and deal with them. Um, obviously, it's an enormous challenge um, and it's something that is going to require uh, political support um, for the people who are trying to affect change and trying to turn things around. Um, not sure if there's anything I've left out there, Honourable Chair. Honourable Winkler, is that the legacy end? Yes, apologies. Honourable Zamin. Chair, I still want to insist. Mm -hmm. The report says that now, even before 1994 and prior to 1994, therefore a lot of corruption has taken place. Now, but the report is only mentioning a one person. Therefore, I'll say without a debate and all these other issues, I'll say, let's remove the name of any individuals that are there and speak about the report. Once now you start to, to zoom in to any individuals as well, there are no facts that are taking place around there. It's just a question of insinuation to say it happened and all that. Thing. It's going to create problem to some of us. In particular, where actually you find that now there is no evidence so far up to now. Therefore, I'll say let the report is good, but let's not mention the names of the people. Let's just talk about the report and its content that now to say there is this kind of purpose. If we check out how many administration did we have? We have the Mandela administration, we have the Tabum Begis administration, we have the Zuma administration, we have uh, uh, Montlantes administration, we have the Ramaphosa administration now that is still on. But I don't think it is fair. Therefore, I am appealing. Let's not use the names of the people in any report like this. Thank you. Harold <laughs> Bryant. Thanks, thanks, Chairperson. Um, Chair, I think we, we obviously wouldn't be able to amend Mr. Rodimer as a report. It's, it's his report and we have invited him as, as a guest. Um, so obviously he would take that into consideration himself. Um, I personally don't see an issue with it. Um, uh, he's, he's speaking, he's speaking around, around facts and, and, and historical issues. I don't think he has a political agenda. But Chair, my, my question is just in terms of um, whether we can we can request Sandparks to to respond um, after this because I think there are a lot of very important issues that have been raised, and I think we should give them the opportunity uh, to respond to some of those issues, uh, if possible, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Honorable Brian, Honorable Mbacha. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I think um, I will agree with what uh, Honorable uh, uh, Lamini has said, because also on the pictures, I saw the picture of one of the uh, leaders in uh, Pumalanga, unless there's a proof that it, it, that's what happened. But for now, because uh, there is no evidence or, or there's no criminal charges, let's not uh, try to implicate uh, members uh, who haven't been uh, trialed. So I will agree with what Comrade uh, uh, Honorable Zamin Mantla Zamini is saying. Thank you. Mr. Ago, what is that the end for? Chair, um, if you wanted us to say something, it was just a, a in case you wanted us, you, we'll, 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 we'll wait for your ruling. Okay, no, no, that's fine. That's fine, Mr. Ago. Uh, at the right time, remember you are part of the agenda items. Uh, you will you will get an opportunity to to respond. We just make we just need to make a ruling on uh, on this matter. Honorable members, remember we invited Mr. Rademeyer to come and make a presentation to us. Now this is his report, and we did not give him his guidelines. We did not give him guidelines on what to encapsulate in the report. Now, if he makes allegations, because this meeting is a public meeting, in, and if Mr. Radimeyer, uh, uh, if there are people who feel Mr. Radimeyer must be sued for defamation of character or anything of that sort, that, will, that can be done. Uh, those people can pursue Mr. Radimeyer. But uh, this is his findings, whether they are substantive or not, it is not for us to make that determination. So that is the ruling. We accept this report as it is, and it is a matter of public scrutiny. If it's a matter that Mr. Radimeyer needs to clarify with the people that uh, he thinks are implicated, um, it's a matter that can be pursued outside the jurisdiction and scope of this particular meeting. Uh, with regards to Sun Parks, if there are issues that you feel you want to respond to, at the right time, when we give you an opportunity to make a presentation, you will speak to how far uh, the issues Mr. Radimir is raising are correct or incorrect at the right time. So that is how we move. Mr. Radimir, you want to take a last bite? Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. No, uh, just to say thank you very much for, for inviting me today um, and my appreciation to, to the Honorable Members. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Radimir, for making time to engage with the Portfolio Committee. Uh, now, if there pleasure. are Am I still in the meeting? Yes, you are, Trey. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, can we move to the next item? Chilis? Yes, Trey, the report. Uh, the report of Nova Scrap. Can you please flight it? Sure. Honorable members, this is the report on Knopfos Kral. I'm sure you would recall that we had uh, taken a decision um, to hand over this matter because the department that we are tasked to provide oversight on has ended over uh, uh, because uh, its role is no longer there in Knopfos Kral. But we had made a commitment to that uh, 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 the leadership of Norfolk Scrum, that uh, we are not going to just let them down and leave this matter unattended. Uh, that's the report. 
Uh, I'm not too sure if I know Honorable Paulson had already made an input, uh, but I want us to go page by page. Chairperson? Uh, Honorable Brian. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Uh, sorry, I think we just lost you for a second there. Um, Chairperson, something I would like to potentially add um, with regards to the final engagement we had in March. Um, I don't know if we can scroll down to that, that was the 7th of March engagement. Uh, yeah, keep going down. Yeah, keep going, it's the last one. Yeah, okay, keep going. Yeah, all the way. Yeah, so this one, the final, the final briefing. I think, Chair, uh, if you can just go further down, the final, yeah, go down, yeah, down. Okay, so then we say, now that we stop there, yeah. So we said that there, stop, stop, stop. Thereafter, the committee deliberated, asked Carrie's leading questions, Judy responded to it. Um, I think it is important for us to mention there, Chairperson, that um, some of the responses that were received, because it says there, um, they were duly responded to by the members. Uh, the response received from the Human Rights Commission was woefully inadequate. Um, and this was pointed out by all committee members at the time. And I think it's important for us to note that um, uh, that was also mentioned by, by yourself. I remember during that meeting, and I think it's included in PMG if we, if we look it up. Um, I don't think that it's a, a, a true reflection to state that uh, the feedback that we received in that meeting was adequate and duly responded to. Uh, the Human Rights Commission uh, report in particular was, uh, was uh, 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 mentioned by, by members, uh, I think all members, um, to be inadequate and incoherent. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to include that, Chair. I agree, Honorable Brian. I agree wholeheartedly. Can you please go a bit up on page eight? No, down, uh, where Honorable Bryant was making reflections. Yeah, there after, there, 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 up a bit. The, the second paragraph from the bottom. There after, yes. The committee deliberated and asked clarifying questions who were true members. However, from the reports that were provided the task team, by the task team, it transpired that the portfolio community of forestry fisheries and has no further oversight role in crab or matter. Yes, right. Chair, I, I would then suggest that after um, uh, after that first sentence, uh, after task team members, full stop, we say concerns were raised in terms of the um, inadequate responses and feedback from the Human Rights Commission, something along those lines. Concerns were raised by members of the portfolio committee in terms of uh, the inadequate responses and presentation made by the Human Rights Committee. Concerns were raised on the incoherence. It were raised by committee members. Okay. Concerns were raised by committee members. On the incoherence. and inadequate yeah, presentation and responses, sorry, and responses by the Human Rights Commission. 
Thanks, Jim. Is it safe to make a recommendation in the same line that whoever was going to read this report must not misconstrue us? They must know that we were not happy with the responses by the Human Rights Commission, and therefore somebody must look into that. Or do we have a session a, a section at the bottom? Chair, I think that would be a that would be a very adequate recommendation. Yeah, but. Um... Uh, up to you, uh, where, you, where you'd like to put it. I wouldn't have any objection to that. You got it, Chilis? The committee, the, after that sentence, the committee there where you put however, for however, the committee therefore recommends. Shall we not put it as a last uh, bullet somewhere here, Chair? It's fine. Even you can put it there as a as a recommendation. Yes. Okay, the committee. Yes, uh, Mr. Pryor. The committee recommends that a comprehensive report. Be demanded from the South African Human Rights Commission. In relation to the matter of Rabo. The time frame there, Chair? Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Whoever is going to read this report must look into this matter as a matter of agent. Perhaps you can put that on the matter of Kharabo as a matter of agents. Okay, so you remove a human right. The committee recommends that a, compre a comprehensive report be demanded from the South African, yes. Okay, you covered Honorable Bryant? Yes, Chairperson, covered, thank you. Okay, can we then move, can we then get the mover for the adoption of the report with all the amendments that have been made? I move, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Bryant. Honorable Winkler. I second that, Chair. Honorable Paulson, are you still in a meeting? I get Colleague, that. Yeah, you would remember that Honorable Paulson had raised the view uh, I think he had said something along the lines that uh, the, before we adopt the report he, it must be mentioned, something like that. That other members argued that the homeless and landless people in the Western Cape and South Africa should find land anywhere and occupy it. Uh, they said that police must keep law and order and prevent evictions. And he said that uh, it wasn't other members, it was the EFF and that it must be put on record. Um, Honorable Mkunu. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, on that, on, on, on this one of uh, Honorable Paulson, uh, I think when we go through the reports, it, it keeps so it, it, it 
uh, just indicates that honorable mem um, committee members uh, uh, views were this because we are here as a portfolio committee. So there is nothing that like uh, we, we are going to put uh, uh, in an EFF as if uh, we, are, we, are, we are not yet on, on elections, we're not yet campaigning. Let's leave it, leave the report like this and move on, Comrade Chair. I, I agree with I thought it as it is. Not include what uh, Honorable Paulson was, was mentioning. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nkunu, Honorable Kanjo, followed by Honorable Bliant and Honorable Weber. Thank you, Chair. I will have to agree with you, Honorable Nkunu. Uh, if you can go through our reports or minutes and whatsoever, you have never <coughs> um, mentioned uh, any political party. Uh, hence, we are not even allowed to wear uh, things with the pol uh, political party logo in the portfolio committee meetings. So I think it will be new if you can start by doing that and that we should not allow Chairperson, let us adopt the report as it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Council. Honorable Bryant. Thanks, Chairperson. Can I just ask quickly, and I, know I did propose for the adoption, but I, if, if possible, can we just go to that section just so we can make sure that we are all on the same page? Because I know uh, Honorable... Uh, Honorable Pawson wanted to make a point of saying that um, his political party was in favour of of um, of land invasions, um, but uh, I also don't want it to be construed that other members of the committee feel the same way because I think it was quite clearly stipulated that other members didn't. Uh, um, which was the section that he was referring to? There is a section that says other members argued. Uh, I'm just trying to find it. Is it that the sentence under 2.1? Other members, oh, there we go. other members argued that, uh, so it wasn't actually other members, it was, it was only one member. So maybe the, a way to say it is to say that one member argued that homeless and landless people, that way you don't have to mention the political party. <laughs> but I don't think there was any more than one member that, that argued that uh, people should find land anywhere and occupy it. <laughs> yeah, well, let us not be found uh, discussing semantics. Honorable Weber. Person, I fully agree with Honorable uh, Bryant. I'm not sure if it will be incorrect to say Honorable Nazir Paulson argued that homeless and landless people will do it because then you cover it every way. But I do think we need to avoid the thing that it's a lot of members in the in the committee as it was only one member. So I do think that needs to be clear. So whether you say one member or whether you say Honorable Nazir Paulson um, argued the following, uh, but I do think uh, other members should be taken out. Thank you. Noted, Honorable Mbata. Honorable Mbata. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, I would say I don't see any problem with the uh, uh, that um, I don't I don't think it's a sentence. It's like a, a semi paragraph. I don't see any problem because we don't mention any political party. In, since I've been here, twenty nineteen, I've never seen a, a political party being mentioned. So we are not campaigning here. There's nothing wrong. We leave it as it is. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Let's make a ruling, honourable members. Let's leave it as it is. There's no way we, there's no need to mention any member 
whether they are three or four. Because once we adopt this report, it becomes a report of all of us. So there's no way we say Honorable Brian said that, Honorable Mudise said that. So this is our report, all of us. Uh, now that it, the report has been adopted, it becomes a product of all of us and all of us take ownership of the contents of this report. So that is how we resolve uh, 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 colleagues. <clears throat> Can we then move to the next item? Because Honorable Bryant has moved for the adoption and Honorable uh, Winkler is seconded. Sorry, uh, Chair. Yes, Honorable Sorry, uh, Chair, I, I raised my hand again. I'm not sure if Dave wants to go before me. I might say what you want to say. So Dave, if you want to say something before me, then want to step on your toes. No, I think you must step on his toes. Okay. Please proceed. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chair, then, um, I, I then don't adopt that because it. Um, I would suggest that then you say a member do that because it is not the committee that said that. It was a person, and I agree with Honorable Mbata, but it's, I don't want this to come back and say, but the committee actually argued that because it was not the committee that argued it. And you just stated now that once this is uh, um, approved, then this is a committee report and it's not the committee that actually said that. And although it is, uh, um, I think it's a dangerous statement that is standing there. And then I will ask that I will refrain then from the adoption of this report if that is not changed to a member. Thank you. Honorable Brian, do you want to come back? Yes, Chair, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to seem like I'm, I'm being a roadblock here, but it, it, it is semantics, but it's important because it, it's not a true reflection. Uh, they, it, 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 it states members, and there weren't other members who were advocating for random land occupations to take place. They, they, they weren't, um, and um, I, 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 you know, I know. Uh, um, Honourable Singh, for instance, is is not present on the on the meeting today. But you know, I wouldn't want anybody to infer that perhaps he was was in favour of it or anybody else. You know, so uh, and and Honourable Paulson has specifically asked uh, that his name be mentioned uh, or, or not his name. But if we if we're not prepared to have his name mentioned, but you know, to to identify himself as being the the member who was who was opposed to that. So. What I will do, unfortunately, Chair, is I'm also I'm 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 not going to be able to to accept it from our side, and and if that is the reading of the committee, so be it. Then we just have to get somebody else to propose it. But uh, it's it's not my understanding that that's a true reflection um, of of what was discussed in the meeting. There was only one member. It wasn't members uh, 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 who were who were in favour of of uh, of of land occupations, uh, whole wholesale random land occupations. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, can you flight that sentence? Uh, I see a whole lot of other hands. Uh, please flight that sentence again, uh, Chilis. Okay, can we put on one member there? Great check. Oh, And we must be careful, uh, honorable members, that uh, in future, we might need to quote each other verbatim. Um, who said what, who said what, but that's fine. I think I get the sense. A me one member, put it one member, not a member. Thank you, does, it read, does it read better? 100%. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, so all those hands, uh, I suspect they are now covered. Honorable Ganjo? No, I'm covered, Chair. Thank you so much. Honorable Tunu? 
Okay. Do we stick through? Do we have to adopt it again, or do we? Do you stand by your adoption, Honorable Brian? Yes, Chair. If need be, I propose adoption um, as amended. As as as, adopt, as amended, Honorable Brian adopts. Can we get a seconder, Honorable Winkler? You are the known culprit. Yes, adopted as amended. Thank you. Wonderful. Second. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can we then move to the next item? Uh, briefing on the APP and strategic plans for 2023-2024 financial year. Um, we had, I see the minister is now here and the deputy minister is here. Uh, I invite you, Minister or Deputy Minister, to give an overview. Uh, greetings, um, Chairperson, and uh, greetings to all honorable members, and greetings to the Deputy Minister. Chairperson, I'm on my phone uh, because I have load shedding, so I'm not able to put my camera on. Um, we had agreed with uh, Deputy Minister that she will do the, the introduction. So I, I just want honorable members to know that I am here and I am listening, uh, but let me hand over to her to do the introduction. Thank you very much and welcome uh, Minister. We had received your apology that you joined the committee at 11 due to other commitments, Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and thanks also to um, honorable members and greetings to um, the FI team or family and its leadership um, from the entities. Uh, when I saw Minister on the platform, uh, I nearly left the screen and do something else. I'm happy just for 10 minutes. I'm happy that uh, she's back, uh, although we are all faced with the same challenge of the um, load sharing. Um, uh, Chairperson and the team, uh, or and the members of Parliament, um, on the platform we are joined by our GP, uh, DG Nomfundo Chabalala, and and all the DGs that you have mentioned, Chairperson, this morning, of which I just want to indicate to yourself that that huge number of DGs, eight of them are women, and I'm sure that uh, the kind of presentation that they will take us through are the ones that they usually do each time that uh, they are summoned to, to, to the portfolio committee. <laughs> Today, uh, Chairperson, uh, we will then uh, take you through the department's APP and strategy plans for 2023-24 financial year, as you have mentioned. Um, DG Nomfundo uh, Chabalala is going to then lead us in this area so that uh, we can quickly then deal with this uh, area because I saw that the, the agenda is for two days and it's very long. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Without any waste of time, can I then uh, hand over to DG Nampundo Chabalala to take us through. Thank you, Chairperson, and thanks to members. Thank you very much, Deputy uh, Minister. Uh, DG, over to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Minister and uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, good morning, Chairperson, and good morning to the members. Uh, as already highlighted by the Deputy Minister, I am going to take the committee through uh, the uh, APP of the department uh, at a high level in terms of the process that we have uh, engaged in as a department in order to finalize this uh, uh, APP. Um, and after that, we are then going to briefly take the committee through the individual programs. We have nine programs in the department. Uh, key indicators that are in the uh, APP uh, together with the targets that we have put through uh, as part of our APP. Chairperson and, and members, just to highlight and uh, um, uh, 
take the committee through the process. And I, I'm not quite sure, Chair, whether Secretariat is going to fly the presentation, but I wanted to just uh, uh, briefly outline the process uh, that we have gone through as a department, um, uh, also to an extent uh, of how we have engaged with uh, key departments like your DPME and also uh, the, the involvement of the Auditor, Auditor uh, General's Office. The process did commence uh, um, uh, in September, um, where we had a session as the whole department working very closely with the Deputy Minister and uh, the Minister uh, and we had the first draft of our APP. One of the critical aspects uh, which also were emphasized in this uh, uh, APP um, is that this is the last year of the current administration and uh, we then are going to be concluding the commitments that were made uh, by this administration uh, since 2019. Um, the first draft was approved uh, uh, by Minister and was then uh, sent to DPME uh, in October, end of October. Uh, DPME provided comments uh, as a way of ensuring that we are indeed aligned, firstly, to the, uh, um, um, the vision and also the vision of the country in terms of the NDP, and also the uh, priorities uh, of the current administration. Um, the, those, that feedback from DPME was received by the department, which then informed a session which we had in January, uh, beginning of this year, uh, 2023, to then uh, work out the second draft uh, 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 with the senior management of the department, which also involved the deputy minister and, and the minister. Um, we then uh, proactively requested the AGSA to also then uh, do a review on this, of which they did uh, um, uh, uh, do a review, and uh, they provide us with their, because this is not necessarily an audit uh, on their side, they call it as a value-add review, which then assists departments to ensure that before we finalize our APP, they would have also given us comments. So they gave us those comments. We had about uh, uh, three uh, findings uh, of three comments that we then had to uh, go back and review our APP on. Firstly, the one was around departmental APP and the extent at which it aligns to the framework of the sector performance APP. So we had to ensure because that uh, alignment was not necessarily coming out very clear, we then had to ensure that that alignment is there. And they made various comments around certain indicators that uh, were not necessarily smart. And we then had to uh, review our APP to then ensure that uh, we are putting forward key indicators and targets that are indeed smart. Um, there was also another aspect uh, where they raised uh, an issue on um, certain information that uh, was required where in the sector, in the framework uh, for sector APP, it does not necessarily um, uh, touch on what the department does, but the sector includes other national departments, uh, provinces, and even management authority. So they had raised an issue to say, why is this not appearing in our, on our APP? We then had to say, uh, provide them with information to clarify that where we are contributing to the sector, that information is in the APP. However, there is a role that we play in terms of coordinating the whole sector. Uh, and we then pull through the IGR structures. We do involve national departments like the Department of uh, Water and Sanitation, 
and also provinces and also management authorities. So we have provided them with information to clarify our role in as far as that is concerned. So those were the issues. I just thought, uh, Honorable Chair and members, I need to highlight their involvement, uh, uh, even though I, I, I think in the beginning of the meeting, it was highlighted that they are not necessarily in this meeting, but they were, uh, they had uh, been involved in terms of then a value add a review that they did on the APP. Now, coming to this APP, uh, can I request that we put it on slideshow? Um, the presentation will cover the purpose, uh, the background and our mandate and strategic focus. Um, and I'm, uh, those three areas, I think I'm going to briefly uh, go through. And it also covers the alignment uh, uh, of our APP to government priorities uh, um, from 2019 in terms of the MTSF 2019 to, to uh, 2024. Um, we will take through the committee also through the budget and uh, uh, human resource information, which is very key uh, in terms of ensuring that we are properly resourced both financially and also uh, human resource so that we are in a position to deliver this APP. I will also just touch on the summary of all the nine programs, uh, the actual targets at a high level. And uh, Chair, uh, with your permission, I will then request that uh, the individual uh, DDGs just briefly no, at, a, at a high level, uh, provide the committee of what are the key indicators that are in their respective branches uh, and also uh, uh, the targets. Um, I will also then uh, come back and indicate to the committee around the aspect of the strategic plan, which still uh, broadly remain as is with a few amendments that we have had to make. And I'm going to then highlight that to the committee and we're going to conclude our presentation. Um, so this is the, the background basically in terms of the APP, um, the department uh, has a, is aligning itself uh, to the MTSF and also the uh, ERRP, which is the Economic Reconstruction and Re Recovery Program. And what is also critical is that in this APP, we look into also some of the commitments that have been announced by the president uh, as part of the state of the, of the nation uh, address. Also critical, and I think I've already highlighted this, that uh, we have, uh, this is a realization of the MTSF, but also more, you know, um, uh, uh, contributing towards the realization of the Vision 2030, which is the NDP. Uh, we have also beyond 2024, also then uh, taken uh, the strategic plan uh, by adding um, uh, a financial year, because this is also informing the rolling plan of the M, uh, um, MTEF. Uh, a financial year 24-25, which then is uh, what has been added in our, in our strategic plan and also the APP. This is our mandate and strategic focus, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think we have uh, gone through this a number of times uh, in the portfolio committee, and, and, and basically our mandate uh, uh, is derived, uh, honorable members, uh, as you all are aware from the constitution, uh, mainly aspects of the chapter two bill of rights and also section 24. Uh, and uh, those are the aspects that are stipulated in the constitution, but critically is uh, our vision in terms of our strategic focus uh, and uh, which have not changed uh, from the original strategic plan. And also the mission in terms of the means by which we are going to be able to achieve the vision. Uh, um, uh, it is stipulated in the vision in terms of then providing leadership in environmental management, uh, conservation, protection uh, towards sustain, sustainable use and sustainability of uh, benefits uh, of South Africans. The values uh, are also uh, areas that we have not changed. 
they still stand around uh, being uh, passionate, uh, proactive, people-centric, and also integrity and, and, and performance-driven. Now, in the next slide, uh, we are then outlining uh, certain aspects uh, which we just want to pull out. There is uh, obviously in our APP more details uh, in relation to this, where we have aligned ourselves to the government priorities and we have aligned ourselves to all seven priorities in terms of the work that we do as a department. Uh, on the first priority on the capable ethical and developmental state, as a department, we have been working tirelessly, though we still do not have a, a favorable or a positive audit opinion, but we're still pursuing uh, the external audit opinion that will ensure that uh, we are uplifting good governance, uh, compliance with the laws and effective financial management. So that still is a critical focus area in this, in this APP. And we also are going to ensure that there's adequately skilled workforce, um, which is transformed and uh, representative of the South African race and gender and key. Uh, these are the um, uh, targets that we've had uh, even in our previous APPs. And we have been uh, setting targets uh, in a staggered manner, but in the 23-24, we are moving towards ensuring that we have 50% females uh, on SMS uh, position and also the 2% uh, um, people with disability within our establishment. Um, coming to the second priority on economic uh, transformation and job creation, there it's mainly around issues of the various master plans and uh, the forestry master plan is uh, uh, being implemented, but also key is around uh, uh, growing uh, the oceans economy. And there the master plan has been going through an in extensive uh, uh, consultations, which have proven not given the um, various areas that are involved in this master plan, including other departments, uh, like the Department of DPE, uh, um, you know, Department of uh, Transport, but also public entities that are very critical in as far as this master plan is concerned, together with industry and also the academic uh, uh, area, uh, sector. So, so we are in the process of trying to finalize this master plan. And obviously this is not necessarily going to be implemented in the current year. We're looking into then uh, ensuring that we're ready for implementation in the next administration. But the main focus is to ensure that we finalize the, the master plan uh, and, and, and uh, uh, its uh, aspects of implementation. The other aspect uh, which we are also focusing on here is on the decent jobs uh, that needs to be created. Um, um, and the focus here is not just creating jobs, but also we need to be addressing the issue of youth unemployment, the issues of ensuring the representation of women and people with disability is indeed a, a, key, a key focus. And we have uh, set targets around uh, your full-time equivalent jobs to be created. That's the 35,477 and also work opportunities. And uh, within work opportunities, we are biased towards ensuring that at least 60% of women are beneficiaries uh, of those jobs. Uh, priority three in terms of education and skills. As a department, we have a responsibility uh, in the sector uh, of ensuring that we promote uh, skills development. And one of the critical areas is around uh, the biodiversity beneficiaries where we are going to train 400 of, of the uh, um, uh, beneficiaries, but also as a department, we have an internship program uh, whereby uh, we then every two years uh, bring on board interns in the various areas of expertise in the department, but not only just the department in entities. However, the 212 is solely the DFFE and entities would have their own uh, uh, respective targets. Uh, the threat on environment uh, um, and quality uh, and human health 
uh, which needs to be mitigated. Uh, it's issues that also impact on health of our, of our uh, citizens. We then need to ensure that uh, we pursue uh, waste management programs, uh, moving towards waste reduction, but also we manage and uh, deal with issues of a quality management uh, and, and monitoring programs. On, on priority area um, uh, five, in fact, it's, it's six of them, uh, apologies, as opposed to seven. Uh, priority area five, um, Around the main emphasis here is on local government, where as a department, uh, we have uh, um, functions where we um, uh, are carried out not only at a, a national level, but concurrent at a provincial level, but specifically here at a local, at a local government uh, level, especially around waste management. And our responsibility there is to ensure that uh, uh, the municipal councillors are continuously trained together with the officials so that we can be in a position to uh, make them aware of the national strategies and what are the compliance matters that really need to be adhered to, uh, adhered to uh, at a municipal and a local level. But also what we are also highlighting here is the collaboration that we have had as a department in terms of uh, uh, cleaning uh, campaigns. And, and I think here, more than anything else, we also partner with SALGA. And the main thing is also to ensure sustainability of the cleanup campaigns. We also need to ensure that there is the involvement of communities and communities begin to take ownership of their spaces uh, and, and working very closely with the municipality to ensure that we have uh, um, a clean uh, um, uh, environment. And then the last is the priority seven, uh, which is a better Africa, where as a department, the main uh, area is around climate change. And uh, uh, key there is the bill, uh, which parliament is currently uh, consulting on, but also the aspect of a just transition to, to low carbon uh, and a climate resilience uh, society. So there are programs that we also be beginning to uh, implement in this APP that informs adaptation and also the mitigation uh, in as far as the climate change is concerned. Also critical in this aspect uh, is implementation of outcome of the various uh, uh, convention. Uh, CBD COP15 is very critical, but linked to that is how then it's mainstreamed uh, with uh, policy areas like your white paper on biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. The involvement of all stakeholders is quite critical, which is what we're going to be uh, uh, pursuing uh, in terms of the implementation, but also key is around the transformation of the sector, which is going to be uh, a, um, a focus uh, in this, in this uh, uh, financial year. The other aspect is on resources, um, uh, especially donor funding. Um, as a department, uh, we do uh, engage and also um, can be in a position to raise uh, international donor funding. We've set a target of uh, 80 million US dollars uh, in order to support various uh, programs in the country uh, in as far as environmental programs are, are concerned. And that will be elaborated uh, in, the, in, the, in the various uh, programs as the DDGs go through them. In the next uh, slide, uh, honorable chair and members, this is our budget. Um, uh, which uh, is going to resource. It's, it's yet to be uh, presented by minister now in May in, in, in the in parliament and also um, uh, be debated upon and approved. Uh, it's a total amount of almost 10 billion, uh, rounding it up. So it's 9.8 billion. But what is of importance uh, is that majority of the resources are in program five and in program six, uh, where we have uh, program five, it is the biodiversity and conservation. 
uh, 2 billion is, is in that program and 3.2 billion is in environmental program. What is also critical to highlight is um, our entities uh, as our delivery model in terms of the mandate uh, of the department are also mainly funded from these two main programs uh, in a form of various transfers, be it infrastructure, EPWP, and a whole host of other uh, uh, programs that are actually earmarked for for, for the entities to fulfill and also implement uh, the, the, the various uh, uh, mandate. Um, and, and the rest of the other allocation uh, 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 chair, which then then of various programs, which then brings that whole total of all programs to 9.8. In the next slide, uh, Honorable Chair, um, beyond the financial resources, it's very critical that we also have the appropriate skills. In terms of human resources in the department, uh, we are then highlighting that uh, these figures, but is that as at the end of uh, uh, December, when we were almost um, uh, in the second um, second uh, draft of the APP, the total post of the department is 3,646. However, there are 487 frozen posts and posts are frozen where we do not have uh, uh, resources. So we, as part of fiscal consolidation by National Treasury, all departments have been given a ceiling in as far as personal costs are concerned. So as a department, uh, we at most uh, can be in a, a position to fill in uh, the 366, uh, uh, 366, of which the then uh, total posts that were filled were 3,003. 155, which then uh, had a vacancy of about 8%, uh, translating to the 291 uh, posts. And we are on an ongoing basis uh, making sure that we uh, ensure that our recruitment process uh, on a continuous basis uh, maintain a vacancy rate that is even lower in as much as the standard is 10%, but we want it to be lower than 8% uh, at any given point in, in time. So th that's the human resource. And I've already alluded to issues of the equity targeting, especially around women uh, and also uh, people uh, with uh, disabilities. In the next slide, uh, Chair, this therefore uh, is presenting the summary of the targets that we have in this APP. Uh, and we have uh, these targets uh, uh, in the various program uh, and the total is 71. You will recall honorable chair that as a department, we have tried to really mainstream and ensure that we focus on strategic uh, indicators that have an impact uh, on service delivery uh, and an impact on the ground, as opposed to focus on internal uh, operational targets, like putting together uh, a report or having a meeting, which does not necessarily have an impact. So by streamlining, we have uh, in the current uh, APP, a total number of 71, 71 targets. Uh, and uh, this is then uh, uh, the various, and a number of them are in biodiversity, uh, chemicals and waste, uh, there's 10, and also in uh, oceans and coasts. And we, with your permission, Chair, just briefly, uh, I think they are not going to take uh, uh, too much time, Chair, uh, the individual DDGs, just to highlight what are the actual indicators that we are putting forward in this APP and what are the targets uh, which uh, we are going to be measured against as we then come back to the portfolio committee to, repro to, to, to report on uh, progress in terms of performance. Uh, Chairperson, uh, if it's allowable from on your side. Siagumala na DJ Kukalaba. 
Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm going to request the CFO uh, and uh, uh, DDG CMS just to cover the first uh, slide 13. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Um, good morning, honorable member. Um, honorable Chairperson, honorable members, uh, minister and deputy minister. My name is Andy Swajas. I'm the CFO of the department. Can I be excused, honorable Chairperson? I currently have load shedding. So to manage the audio, I will request that my video be off. Um, thank you so much for that. From program one administration, what we are responsible for is to ensure that we promote good governance and compliance with uh, legislative requirements and also ensure that we uh, promote effective financial management. From, from the office of the CFO, we have two targets. One, we are committed and we are striving to ensure that we, we get an unqualified audit opinion, which will be expressed by the Office of the Auditor General, and also in order for us to improve and ensure effective financial management from the overall target that the DJ spoke about, which is about 9.7 billion, we are committing ourselves that we will spend 98% of that target, of that, of that entire 9.8 billion that has been allocated for the department. So those are the two um, targets that we have set for ourselves for the 2023-24 um, APP. Thank you so much, honorable chair and members. Thanks, Chair. My name is Mamukhadi Mashala. I'll also be talking to slide 13 um, on corporate management, which is specifically responsible for capacitating the department to this particular effect in terms of the outcome as already um, outlined by the DG in terms of alignment with the MTSF. We strive to um, fill our vacancies, but with prioritization and ensuring that we meet uh, align with the demographics of the country in terms of um, representation at both um, female as well as PWD. In terms of females, our target at senior management is 50% and PWDs, we are targeting a 2% uh, overall. Relating to capacity development of the sector, our contribution is to um, ensure that we contribute to the skills development and we do this through provision of uh, budgets. Our target for the financial year under review is to issue at least 110 a bursaries with 40 for the full-time uh, employees and 70 uh, mainly for the external and part-time uh, bursaries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I request that uh, DDG uh, for program two take us through the key indicators? Thank you, DG. Good morning, honorable members, honorable chair. Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister and colleagues, my branch is responsible for the promotion of the development of enabling legal regime, as well as the licensing authorization system that will promote enforcement and compliance and to ensure coordination of sector performance. Next slide. As part of the uh, outcome to improve compliance with environmental legislation and environmental threats to be mitigated, we have indicated five indicators. Uh, the number of all environmental authorizations inspected for compliance, our target will be 170. Number of finalized criminal investigation dockets handed over to the NPA for prosecutorial decisions are 46. Number of administrative enforcement notices issued for non-compliance with environmental legislation, it's 270. And the number of inspections conducted for the verification of rhino horns, as well as elephant tusk stockpiles, we're looking at a target of 65. Uh, to contribute for the outcome for improved human resources capacity of the sector, uh, my branch will uh, train. Uh, in uh, officials in environmental compliance and enforcement, our target is 720. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the program three, Oceans and Coasts, uh, thank you.
Chair, um, I don't know whether it's on my side. Uh, Dr. Figizolo. It doesn't look like he is in the meeting. Um, can I therefore uh, go through this uh, slide? Uh, oh, did you, sorry, Chair, yes. this is for you. Um, yes, did, you, did you, can I request that we move on to another branch and um, DG's office must find Dr. Figizolo. I have no inv information that he's unable to attend today. So he must be found. Let's move on to another branch. Thank you, Minister. We will go to climate change. Uh, the acting DDG will take us through. Thank you, DG, and greetings to Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, and Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, on the climate change program, uh, the focus really is to facilitate um, mainstreaming of environmental sustainability to address the issue of uh, the just transition as well. In terms of the key um, output indicators, we have, of course, a number of climate change mitigation interventions undertaken to facilitate the implementation of the low emission strategy and the annual target we have to develop the draft sectoral emission target to be published for public comment. And this will be one of the um, instruments that will be, uh, of course, advancing the bill once it becomes an act. Uh, on the number of intervention and uh, um, adaptation, we have two areas of work. One is the development of the ocean and coast adaptation plan. And the second one is the development of the risk and vulnerability assessment for the five human settlement priority areas uh, that has been published by the human settlement. This is part of mainstreaming to ensure that uh, in uh, undertaking human settlement planning, climate change, risk and vulnerability are taken into consideration. On the outcomes on the threat of, on environmental quality and human health mitigated, we have two indicators. One is the national air quality indicator to ensure that we keep the target within the ambient air quality standards. Uh, this is called the NACI. And we also have a target that will ensure that we have a number of air quality monitoring station reporting to the South African Air Quality Information System, meeting the minimum data recovery standard of 75%. And on the, on the target, we have 15 priority areas, ambient air quality monitoring station uh, reporting to SACWIS to meet the data recovery standard of 75%. On the last one, on the outcome on the international cooperation, uh, supporting South Africa's environment and sustainable development priorities. We have an indicator on the financial value of resources raised from international donors to support South Africa um, and, and African uh, environmental programs. And we have a target of 80 million US dollars to be raised. Thank you, DG, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can then go to program five. Thank you, DG. Good morning to you, to the minister, deputy minister, portfolio committee members and colleagues. Um, the mandate of the branch is to ensure the regulation and management of biodiversity, heritage and conservation matters in a manner that facilitates sustainable economic growth and development. Next slide. And then in terms of uh, what we aim to achieve for the next financial year, the output, the first output indicator relates to the number of hectares of land added to the conservation estate per annum which is uh, the target is 610,674 hundred hectares. The second 
output indicator relates to the report on implementation of improvement plans for six management authorities produce. This target relates to management effectiveness, and our target is to produce a status report on implementation of improvement plans for the six management authorities. The third output indicator relates to the number of interventions to ensure conservation of strategic water sources and wetlands implemented. And our target is to implement two interventions, which include the designation of one Ramsey site and securing three strategic water source areas. And relating to the outcome on biodiversity threats mitigated, the first indicator is regulatory tool to ensure conservation and sustainable use of uh, biodiversity development and developed and implemented. And the target is to submit the national assessment report on the linkages between migration and desertification, land degradation and drought to cabinet uh, for implementation. And then the next one in respect of the high level panel recommendations and interventions, we intend to then uh, implement the program of work for the white paper, which has just been adopted by cabinet, white paper on conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. And then the second intervention relates to the revision of the national biodiversity economy strategy, which we aim to submit to cabinet for approval and publish for public comments. Next slide relating to the outcome on improved access, uh, fair and equitable, benef ben equitable sharing of benefits. The output uh, indicator relates to the number of biodiversity economy initiatives uh, implemented and the annual target on that, we will be uh, implementing three initiatives. The first one is the creation of uh, 800 jobs, uh, jobs opportunities, and then the training of 400 beneficiaries. Uh, and this is largely accredited training and the donation of 3,000 heads of gain to previously disadvantaged individuals and communities. And the next one relates to the number of benefit sharing agreements approved, and we intend to get five benefit sharing agreements approved. Then the last um, outcome relating to indigenous forest uh, sustainably managed and regulated. This is a new directorate that has been moved to the branch. Um, we intend to, uh, the output indicator relates to the number of state indigenous forest management units maps and that mapped and that is about five of them. And then also the clearing of invasive alien species uh, in respect of the number of hectares um, to be rehabilitated. And the target there is uh, 300. Thank you very much, uh, Digi. Thank you, Chair. Let, let, let me apologize. Uh, Dr. Figizolo uh, is not in, uh, but the acting DDG is in the meeting. However, uh, Dr. Naidu uh, has challenges with, the, with connectivity. So I'm not quite sure whether we can then go back to program three and see whether he can present. He is in the meeting. Hopefully connectivity is fine. But if it's not fine, uh, I will take the committee through that program. Thank you, Chair. Um, honorable members, um, Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right, I'll leave the camera off. Uh, my apologies. I, I did start presenting earlier, but it seemed no one could hear me or, or see me. So let me leave the camera off. Um, thank you. Uh, program three, oceans and coasts. The, um, the major outcome of the program would be to look at threats to environmental integrity, manage those, and the ecosystem conserve. We have 10 targets, as DG mentioned. Next slide, please. First target would be to look at water quality in the four coastal provinces. And this will continue what we started in um, in the last four years to look at priority areas and to monitor and to produce a water quality report for four for 40 priority areas in the coastal provinces. The next target would be to do the first marine spatial plan, now that the act has passed a few years ago. Um, and to do this, the, main, the first area targeted will be the west coast area. 
earlier this year, the sector plans, that is the major industries in the ocean, their departments published their sector plans or ambitions of how they would like to use the ocean. Based on that, the first sub-regional plan will be developed. Continuing with our um, annual production of marine protected area plans, a further two plans will be developed in the next financial year for the South Atlantic, Southeast Atlantic Seamounts and the Southwestern Indian uh, Ocean Seamounts. These are mountainous areas um, on the ocean, the areas very rich in biodiversity, and uh, most of them are in, um, uh, we seek to provide most of them with some protection because of their biodiversity uh, levels. Uh, within this year, we, or within the last uh, two years, we published for comment twice the Penguin Biodiversity Management Plan. Uh, and at the moment, we've revised that uh, based on comments to, that we got last year, and we hope to finalize that. Parallel to this is the international panel that's looking at uh, uh, fisheries interactions and penguins and possibility of closed areas, and any outcome of that uh, will be incorporated into this next iteration of the Penguin Biodiversity Management Plan. For estuarine management, the four major estuaries that uh, the department itself at national level will be looking at providing ongoing warrant reports, so for Buffalo, Durban, Richards Bay, and the Orange River. The next target is to um, develop amendments to the Toxic Cities Act. The current Toxic Cities Act was uh, done in 1996, and it needs an update, especially that in the last uh, four years, we, uh, we published the Antarctic Strategy, and in this year, we hope to align the Antarctic Cities Act with um, outcomes of the strategy. Next slide, please. Then, um, with marine protected areas, to expand the area under protection, over the last uh, two or three years, we've engaged with um, academics, uh, scientists from other national organizations uh, and provinces and developed candidate areas for to expand the protected areas. And uh, we're looking to finalize these and then present these as candidate areas for the next set or the expanding the current set of marine protected areas. The number of scientific publications, uh, the department uh, is the only department that runs, uh, that operates offshore research vessels. And so we do provide an opportunity for both internal scientists, but also for academics from uh, universities and other national agencies. And then we would hope to produce um, 20, annually 20 uh, peer reviewed publications from, uh, from the monitoring and science projects that we have. The ongoing um, relief voyages of the SA Gallus II, um, these have to be done because we have to change out the personnel at the three bases, uh, the base in Antarctic, Antarctica, Gough Island, and Marion, but also undertake the science projects and programs that we do while we are doing the relief voyages that has to continue annually. And then the um, last target is for us to produce the annual science report card. And what is the relationship between the annual science report card and the research publications? Generally, we have uh, many stakeholders who want the last data point. So every year we count uh, many of the seabird species, the seals, we do um, a whale estimate. Uh, we also measure currents. Uh, we look at plankton assemblages around the uh, ocean areas adjacent to um, South Africa mainland. And these takes one to three years to get into a peer reviewed publication, but annually we produce the last data point so if stakeholders are interested in having the most updated information, they look at the annual science report card, which we put out uh, at the end of every financial year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, the next is program six, which is environmental programs. Uh, and the DDG there is going to take the committee through the key indicators. Thank you. Thank you, TG. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, DG and colleagues. Um, the purpose of Program 6 is um, implementing the expanded public works programs and green economy projects in the environment sector. Um, next slide, please. Um, the branch has four outcomes, and the first outcome and out out aligns with uh, Priority 2 on um, economic transformation and, and job creation, which the DG spoke to when she made her earlier inputs. So within this outcome of decent jobs created, sustained with youth, human, and persons with disabilities as priorities, 
we aim to create as a as, um, um, number of full-time equivalents for the year is 35,477. And we will thereafter, um, in this regard, create um, 71,035 work opportunities. And in creating these work opportunities and the associated full-time equivalents, Chair, we will also then, in line with the outcome, prioritize opportunities for women, opportunities for youth, and also opportunities for people living with disabilities. The second outcome that we contribute to is ecosystems rehabilitated and managed. In this regard, um, and also in line with the priorities relating to conservation, um, the branch will ensure that um, the, we, we are able to uh, clear um, 70,066 hectares um, infested with invasive alien plants and also um, clear 532,100 hectares of follow-up clearing where in areas wherein we've previously done the work um, clearing invasive island plants. When it comes to wetlands um, under rehabilitation, we intend to rehabilitate 115 wetlands in the current financial year and also maintain our activities relating to um, cleaning coastline, the 2,116 kilometers of coastline cleaned. On outcome um, three, which is related to integrated farm management, uh, we will en endeavor to uh, make sure that we uh, suppress 90% of fires. And also in the last outcome on infrastructure adaptation and disaster risk reduction, we will, there, in that regard, we will create um, 23 infrastructure with 10 being constructed and 13 being renovated. And when it comes to overnight visitor and staff accommodation units, we will construct 10 and also then re renovate uh, 11. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, our next program is program uh, seven and the DDG will take you through the, the uh, indicators. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Good morning to Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister and colleagues. In terms of Program 7, um, our mandate uh, focuses on protection of the environment from uh, the negative impacts associated with chemicals and waste through ensuring that there are legislative and other measures, uh, authorizations, directives and agreements Moving on to the next slide, um, the first outcome that Program 7 focuses on is with regard to the mitigation of threats uh, that threaten uh, environmental quality and human health. The first indicator focuses on uh, mercury, which is a heavy metal um, that also has an impact on environment. Um, we are planning to finalize the mercury regulations we had in the past financial year, uh, initiated consultations. The next um, indicator focuses on um, the chemicals, um, reducing um, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, uh, which are mainly refrigerants and um, these chemicals are used also in uh, air conditioners. Um, they have an impact on the ozone layer. So our target is to reduce the consumption by 50%, which is uh, about 2,570 tons. Um, the next uh, indicator focuses on um, waste. Uh, it has to do with um, regulatory um, instruments uh, that we have introduced. Um, covering the policy on extended producer responsibility. The year that ended in March, uh, we have uh, published for implementation uh, EPR schemes for three products, portable batteries, oils, and pesticides. In this current year, we are planning to finalize registration and work with the National Treasury to approve the EPR fees for, the, for these three products. Also um, uh, focusing on waste uh, diversion, we have uh, three other waste streams that are currently under EPR implementation, that is paper and packaging, electrical and electronic waste and lighting waste. And um, for the coming, uh, this current year, we will be 
uh, increasing the tonnages that are diverted. Uh, the first year of implementation was 2022, and this year it's 2023, and new uh, targets um, taken forward. Um, also on waste diversion, uh, we also have a priority waste stream, waste tires. Uh, we are also planning to increase uh, the number of um, tonnages of waste tires um, that are diverted through uh, recycling as well as energy recovery. Um, given that um, we have the Waste Management Bureau uh, implementing the waste tire operations in this year, we are also planning to publish for implementation the section tire Section 29 Tire Industry Waste Management Plan uh, on tires um, that would enable um, the uh, management of waste tires. The next outcome that Program 7 focuses on is on support to a local government with regard to uh, the waste management function. Uh, we will be supporting the a training of uh, municipal councillors as well as officials on waste management. And we will also be um, the cleaning campaigns in municipalities, um, also ensuring that uh, their landfill sites and refuse collection is also supported. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Uh, program eight is our next program. Uh, DDG, uh, over to you. Good morning, uh, DG. Uh, good morning to the honourable members. Um, honourable mm -hmm. Chair, Deputy Minister, and Minister. Can I continue, Chair? Okay. Yes, um, I'm sorry. Please proceed, uh, DDG. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of the branch is to develop and facilitate the implementation of policies and targeted programs to ensure sustainable management of forests in the next slide. In doing this, what we will focus on um, are two main uh, outcomes. The first outcome will deal with the sustainable production of state forests, where we're trying to ensure that our plantations are better managed. Uh, through this, uh, we will then ensure that the uh, number of uh, the number of hectares that are brought back uh, through planting the temporarily unplanted areas would be 1,800 hectares. And then linked to that would be the number of hectares under civil cultural practices, whereby we make sure that whatever has been planted uh, is maintained um, to ensure that there is better production in the plantations. And the target there is 2,100 hectares. And then um, in terms of the nurseries that uh, are to be refurbished, we are targeting three. These will then assist us also in terms of contribution towards the greening program, which is on the next outcome. And then um, as part of uh, our master plan implementation, we had uh, indicated that um, the department will move away from direct management of the plantations and we are targeting that we will then uh, transfer aid of this plantation to the communities. And then the second uh, outcome deals with the threats on environmental quality and human health uh, being mitigated. Uh, in that, uh, we, that is where we'll then uh, implement our greening program where we are looking at the number of trees that we want to plant outside the forest footprint, which will be 150,000 uh, trees. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, uh, Chair. I think the presentation um, Yes, I think the next uh, um, program is uh, Program 9, Fisheries Management. Uh, we are going to then uh, uh, cover this as part of the MLRF. Um, and uh, um, uh, the DDG, uh, who is then the uh, uh, responsible for the MLRF, 
will cover both program nine and the MLRF uh, uh, as part of the MLRF uh, presentation. But before, before she then covers the MLRF, I also want to highlight chair and members that we have also in the presentation, though we are not going to go into the details, uh, we have indicated how the STRAT plan had been revised uh, and these has been uh, retabled uh, as an annexure to the 2023-24 APP. And the main revision uh, of the STRAT plan was to ensure that we consistently still aligned uh, firstly uh, to, to the priorities, but also uh, government's planning cycle. Um, and that is where then we had had to uh, have the year for 2024-25 to then uh, ensure that uh, in terms of the MTEF, it is informing a three-year rolling plan uh, of, the, of the MTEF. Um, and also, I think the other aspect, which I've already alluded to, is that uh, the indicators, uh, the main focus has been on the strategic uh, indicators as opposed to the operational indicators, uh, whereby we have now come down to uh, about uh, uh, lesser indicators than we had at the beginning of the STRAT plan. So the STRAT plan basically does not change much. Those were just the only amendments uh, that we did. Uh, and these revisions uh, were actually uh, uh, in line with the DPME guideline in terms of then uh, continuous uh, uh, reporting on the um, uh, strategic uh, plan. So that's what I would like to highlight, uh, Chair. And with your permission, uh, uh, is uh, we request that we then go through the MLRF and the DDG for Program 9 is going to cover Program 9, including uh, the MLRF uh, indicators and targets. Uh, um, over to you, DDG. So thanks, thanks Chair. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, um, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, Honourable Minister, um, Honourable DM, uh, and colleagues, uh, and uh, colleagues from the entities. The, uh, I'm going to be, as the DG said, the, uh, we operate both as Program 9 under the um, department, as well as uh, we operate the Marine Living Resources Fund. And the Marine Living Resources Fund is a Schedule 3A public entity uh, which finances the operations of the fisheries branch, but our salaries are paid by the uh, uh, National Department. And the mandate and the purpose of the fisheries branch is to manage the development and monitoring and sustainable uses of marine living resources and to protect the integrity and quality of the marine ecosystems and to ensure the growth of the aquaculture sector. If we can go to um, slide three, um, which details the um, targets for the 23-24 financial year, as I've said, most of the, uh, there's a similarity between Program 9 and the Marine Living Resources Fund with the exception of three additional targets that are included under the MLRF. And I'll highlight those when we get to them. Uh, so the first target is to submit the Aquaculture Development Bill to Parliament in this coming financial year. Uh, in we also will be implementing 100% of the action plan for the National Freshwater Inland Wild Capture Fisheries. In terms of well-managed and regulated uh, fisheries and aquaculture sector, we will be conducting 5,500 inspections in six key priority fisheries. Um, focusing on six key priority fisheries, but not only. 
Uh, we will be um, servicing all 22 fishing sectors, but the six priority fisheries are hake, abalone, rock lobster, lionfish, squid, and pelagics. Uh, we will be conducting 290 verifications in the six priority fisheries. Uh, we will be doing 40 joint operations with partners. Now, this is uh, one of the targets that is uh, under the MLRF and doesn't appear under program nine. And this is um, 40 joint operations with par uh, enforcement partners, including Operation Pakisa. We will also be delivering four key deliverables in the National Plan of Action on Sharks. If you can go to the next slide. Um, this year, we will also develop a draft National West Coast Rock Lobster strategy. We have an anti-poaching strategy, and we now need to turn that into a broader strategy for lobster. Uh, we will be allocating um, small-scale fishing rights to small-scale cooperatives in the Western Cape, concluding that process. And we will roll out 100% of the integrated development support program uh, to small scale fishing cooperatives in the four coastal provinces. And then the last two are MLRF specific targets uh, dealing with the Working for Fisheries program. And under the Working for Fisheries program, we will be creating 900 full time equivalents and 1,500 job opportunities. And then if I can just ask you to skip, we'll skip the risk plan and go to that slide. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but that just outlines the budget that is allocated per program from um, administration, marine resource management, aquaculture and economic development, fisheries research and development, and monitoring control and compliance and the budget allocation there for um, this financial year across all the programs is 472 million rand. Chair, with your permission, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Chavasan. Uh, uh, in the presentation that we tabled, uh, we also have gone through the details of the 9.8 uh, billion uh, budget. Uh, and uh, um, I just wanted to indicate that uh, um, the details uh, are as per the uh, slide uh, 51, where it is then uh, demonstrating on how the department is resourced over the MTF uh, uh, up to 25, 26. And obviously the outer years are indicative uh, and uh, um, informed by uh, the uh, uh, year one. It also uh, provides detail in the next slide in terms of how then, in terms of economic classification, how then the 9.8 uh, billion is, is categorized uh, in terms of the current expenditure, which is mainly your compensation of employees, your goods and services, uh, interest and rent on land, and also on transfers, where then we transfer to various uh, either provinces, the entities of the departments and other agencies. And we also have payment for capital and the payment for financial assets, which uh, in this case, we do not have any items. So this is the economic classification in line with National Treasury guidelines. Uh, the next slide, I'm not going to go into details because the, they, the uh, respective public entities, as they present their APPs, will also talk to their overall budgets. But what we are highlighting here is how much uh, from the department is going to be transferred to these various entities and what exactly are the components of these transfers earmarked for in the various in the various. Uh, entities. Um, and uh, also key is on the expanded public uh, works program, where entities are very uh, critical in 
the implementation of the expanded public works program. We've also highlighted how much each entity is going to be uh, receiving in as far as that is concerned. And this therefore brings us to the end of the presentation of the department together with the Marine Living Resource Fund. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, uh, honorable members. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> DG and your team. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, uh, that is the presentation of the APP and the strategic plans of 2023, 2024, uh, uh, and uh, MLRF. May I invite you to, <clears throat> to, to engage this report? I note you, uh, Honorable Winkler. Um, Honorable Chair. Sorry. Yeah, Minister. Sorry, Chair. Can I just um, note that the, um, the, there's a delegation um, from the UAE representing COP28 that are arriving at my office now. Myself and the climate team are just going to step outside for a short meeting with them. So I'll, I'll request that um, if there are particular issues that um, uh, honorable members would want my reflections on, um, I would obviously be in a position to do that um, when I step back in at, at 1.30. I also just wanted to check whether you're taking a lunch break. Yeah, immediately after the responses, uh, uh, honorable minister from the department, we will take a lunch break. Um, maybe we should allow you and the climate team to meet that delegation. And uh, we should probably break at exactly one o'clock and then we'll uh, come back at half past one. Thanks, Chairperson. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be back with you at half past one. Thank you. So we will just Thanks. note if there, if there are issues that you might need to respond to, we'll, we'll help you noting them. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, Honorable Wingler, you'll be followed by Honorable Kancho and then followed by Honorable Weber. In that order. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the department for um, the comprehensive reports. Um, so I have a number of questions pertaining to the various programs. Um, I know under the priority five, um, I think, which deals with waste management, there was a note made that 300 municipal councillors and officials would be trained. If they could just unpack exactly what the training entails um, and how this relates to waste management in the cities, because it is my understanding, especially in many municipalities that are, are really uh, failing to, I think, perform in their core mandates that waste management of, um, very often falls by the wayside. Uh, so what, what does this training entail? Uh, is it also, besides training, is there going to be resource capacitation? For example, um, are they going to be provided with resources for separation at source? Um, are they going to be trained on how to interact with the informal sector and the waste pick sector um, when it comes to waste management? So just to unpack that a bit more. Um, then with regards to priority seven, um, and this falls under the climate and air quality program, uh, with regard to the just transition, um, there was mention made of, you know, the oceans and coasts um, and other programs, but a huge component of the just transition regards obviously transitioning the energy sector um, in terms of the labor involved in coal and other fossil fuel production to renewables. So my question is, what sort of engagement has been had with the Department of Energy, with labor and trade and industry? Because those departments are, of course, integral in ensuring the success um, of the just transition. And any program that the Department of Environmental Affairs embarks on is going to hinge on the collaboration um, of those departments and aligning, for example, the IRP with our targets in terms of the Paris Agreement. So just to unpack that and where that sort of cross-departmental collaboration sits um, at the moment. 
With regards to human resources, it was made mention of that there are 487 frozen posts um, and 291 vacant posts. Are there any particular departments where you find a concentration of these vacant posts and is that impeding the work of the department? Are any of these in perhaps management positions or other key positions? And what is the department's plan to ensure that those vacancies are filled as a matter of urgency? With regard to environmental compliance, I see that from all the programs, uh, funding is, I think, least allocated to compliance, but a major responsibility or mandate of the Department of Environmental Affairs is, of course, ensuring that um, compliance is, is upheld, um, uh, specifically with you know, NEMA and NEMBA legislation. For example, we have an entire industry of captive bred lions, uh, we have a lot of poaching happening in the fishery sector um, and also management of, of, of the fishery sector. And yet uh, compliance is the biggest issue when it comes to those to those controversial issues. Um, and yet there's, I think, a, a lack of funding going into that department. Um, is there a rationale behind this? Um, and, and what are we going to do to improve um, adherence to compliance? Um, across the various programs if compliance itself is not being given enough resources to fulfill its responsibilities. Uh, with regard to the NPA, there were 46 dockets apparently that have been handed over. Um, how many are outstanding um, at the moment? Then uh, program three, oceans and coasts, water quality testing. I think it's a program that's being rolled out in four coastal provinces. Um, does this include KwaZulu-Natal, of course? Um, and what is being done with regard to the Etequini sewage crisis that is currently underway? Um, in April, I think the April Easter period, um, one of our main beaches, um, Mshlanga Beach, was closed due to um, poor water quality and, and the very high E. coli levels. Um, and I wonder, does this program take cognizance of priority areas like perhaps Etequini? where there's an ongoing catastrophic sewerage issue that is impacting the, the economy of the city and it's also destroying the natural heritage of the city. Um, and what exactly is, is the plan and, and how does this water quality program inter, interface perhaps with that? Um, give me a second, sorry. Yes, in terms of chemicals and waste. So... Again, there was mention of 300 councillors and officials being trained, but are there going to be sustainable plans put into place um, that are going to capacitate municipalities to take waste management effectively forward as opposed to just small interventions? Um, and is there going to be, I think, regular um, check-in and capacity building in municipalities? Um, also, what was not made mention of is that there's a huge issue where we have um, individuals living in, in massive informal settlements that do not have an adequate means of disposing of their waste. And this is a huge um, indictment, I think, on these municipalities because these people um, are living in, in um, areas where they, they don't know how to dispose of their rubbish and they, they have to live with the waste and often the waste finds itself going into water courses like rivers where those same individuals have to use that water for, for cooking and living. Um, and so I think that what is really needed is an emergency sort of priority plan on how waste specifically in, form, in informal settlements is going to be managed going forward. Um, and that also then will speak to, you know, conservation and, and um, environmental protection at the same time. Um, in terms of program eight and forestry management, we speak about uh, greening programs and the planting of 150,000 trees. I wonder how forestry management also interacts with the, the goals and objectives of the climate program, um, you know, because forests form um, carbon sinks. And uh, I wonder if there's any interaction with that and if under the forestry management program, there is a, a climate sort of division to that. Um, yes, that's everything from me so far. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Luingla. Honorable Ganjo. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Let me appreciate the report. 
Chair, I have only three questions uh, because some of the questions have been covered by Honorable Winkler. Uh, and uh, program four, Chair, they've mentioned the international donors to support South Africa. I just want them to tell us um, the specific programs that will be supported by these resources. Uh, it's quite a good um, initiative, but we want them to be specific or, or in terms of the programs that will be supported. And, and um, program five, uh, biodiversity economy initiatives or program. And also I just want to check how um, are they going to increase uh, the capacity and the participation of uh, previously disadvantaged individuals and, and communities and in this program. And also what strategies uh, that will be employed to ensure that this, um, to ensure the sustainability of this program. And um, lastly, Chair, under human resources, they've mentioned uh, 291 vacant posts. And if they can also give us time frames, and when do they uh, plan to fill these vacant uh, uh, positions, Chairperson? Thank you. Other um, questions have been covered by Honorable Winkler. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Weber. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right. Thank you, Chair. Chair, on uh, priority number five, I just want to get there quickly. Um, it was slide six. All right, priority number five. It was mentioned that there was 300 municipal councillors or officials trained. I would like to know what the criteria that was used to identify in which municipality these councillors will uh, 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 how they were identified in order to do it. Have there been a difference in the municipalities that um, a significant difference by the councillors or officials being trained? And then um, are, is the department going to move the training of um, uh, municipality councillors and officials going to eventually start covering all the municipalities? Um, uh, who is paying for this training? Is it the department or is it SOLGA or is it the municipality itself? Then I also want to go um, to the 80 million that has been identified. If the department, once they have budgeted for all this monies, how and where and how this will be spent. Then um, Sorry, I'm just going through all my questions. Um, regarding, it is amazing to see how many accredited training there is going to take place. Um, some of it is permanent posts. There's one slide that shows the 40 permanent posts and then 110 temporary posts. But I'm a little bit concerned. I understand it comes from different budget points, but we have currently over 400 frozen posts due to a lack of resources. And then uh, we have over 291 posts that is vacant. So if a post is frozen, it was explained that there's no resources for it. Should it not be wise to use resources to first or to use the money to get these posts that is important and frozen budget for it? Because we keep on training people, but we have over 500, 600 posts well, vacant and frozen. And, and I do think it's important that we need to get these posts filled. Um, then I want to know, I see a couple of the programs have given um, uh, their books or over to the external audit. I want to know um, how much the cost is of an external audit and once, uh, when will, do they expect to have the audit from the external auditors coming back? And if they will uh, let us know what their findings were on those audits. Um, regarding waste, um, I've seen, and we have many meetings about 
the disposable diapers and I know the department is busy with some documentation on diapers. I don't see that covered anywhere and diapers at this stage is one of our main uh, resources that um, uh, troubles our waterways in, in many ways. So um, maybe I missed it, but what is what are we doing about the um, disposable diapers? Um, I have one question on air pollution, but I will put in written questions on that. But my question is, there's 15 priority areas where uh, the monitoring is going on to SACIS. My question is, Kendall is one power station that is probably the biggest culprit and the most polluted one. I want to know why and how Kendall is reporting on the emissions, to whom they're reporting it, because it's not on Sakis. And I would like to know if there's any other of our significant power stations and their monitoring of air pollution, why that is not also on Sakis, and what we can do to ensure that is happening, because I'm not sure who is doing Kendall's monitoring. Then I just want to Look at finalizing everything. Chair, I think that will be fine for now. All other questions I will put into uh, uh, written questions. There was just one question about the notices that's been given. I know Honorable Winkler spoke about the cases that went to the NPA, but um, can we have an indication if there has been any notification for monitoring wrongly emissions? to any of our power stations within the high priority areas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Weber. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Uh, uh, look, DJ, we, we, we understand that the, the, the Ocean Economy Master Plan is a multi-stakeholder plan involving uh, repair, marine manufacturing, marine transport, offshore oil, gas, aquaculture, fisheries, and so on. Um, and of course, the, the private businesses within the oceans economy to, to try and aid job creation and increase our gross domestic product and the economic recovery and, and potential growth. But, but how does the department want to ensure that uh, all the stakeholders uh, effectively make their respective uh, fair contributions to the comprehensive implementation of the ocean master, uh, economy master plan? What, what are the sticks, what are the carrots that uh, 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 the department would use to ensure that everyone comes on board uh, to ensure the implementation? Uh, uh, at at a great time frames, um, I see. I see you have also consulted a number of stakeholders in government on finalizing the uh, the APPs that you have presented here. Uh, I, I'm just wondering what does it mean uh, in terms of the implementation? Uh, are you saying to us that we are likely to see a better implementation? or a higher achievement on, of, of the current set of APP, uh, APPs than we have in, in, the, in, the, in the past three, four years ever since we were here. Uh, if we can be clarified uh, just on that. Uh, DG, I'm not too sure who started. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. And uh, thank you to uh, yourself, Honorable Chen, Honorable Members, uh, for the questions that you, you've uh, highlighted. Um, I, I will um, request the DDGs to respond to the respective areas. There are areas where I will also then come in at the end uh, in relation to some of the matters and issues that have been raised uh, for clarity by, by honorable members. I think the question by honorable Weber uh, on the 15 priority areas, 
I don't know whether, Chair, uh, am I correct or I heard uh, uh, Honorable Weber ride around the Kendall uh, um, uh, station because I think there, there's a lot of details that uh, she's requiring on whether it will be part of the written questions or we are expected to, to respond to that uh, uh, and at this point in time. Um, but we would really request that we be given an opportunity to ensure that we respond comprehensively uh, in writing so that we provide all the information that is being requested by, by Honorable Weber. I'm going to go uh, through the various programs uh, and they will then uh, respond to their respective areas. Uh, there's certain areas at the end that I will come back and cover, uh, Chair. We will start with the CFO uh, and also the um, uh, DDG CMS. Um, there's vacant position, turnaround time of vacancies, uh, but also there's issues around the audit, uh, the audits, external audits, and uh, what the target actually entails. Uh, thank you, Chair. Over to the CFO and uh, DDG CMS. Thank you, DJ. Um, thank you to the honorable members for the questions. Um, from my side, the question is around the audit. What we have put as our target for the 23-24 financial year APP is that we are striving to ensure that we get an unqualified audit opinion, which will be expressed by the Office of the Auditor General. According to the legislative timeframes, um, AG is supposed to finalize the audit by the 31st of July. So meaning for the entire operations that will be taking place in the 2023-24 in the financial year, we will be submitting our financial statements on the 31st of May, and then Auditor General will start with their audit with the conclusion being provided to the department at the end of July. So that is the target that we are um, striving to achieve for the 2023-24 APP. Thank you. Thanks. Um, in terms of the vacancy rate, the vacancies are not concentrated in one specific uh, area. We balance between the turnaround um, um, in terms of exits as well as um, new uh, vacancies. So the vacancies are basically spread in all um, the, the uh, management. However, priority has been um, on filling of um, critical uh, posts, mainly in the core functions, as well as uh, senior management um, posts. Uh, posts that which um, have been um, filled in the last um, quarter of the financial year, it was um, 60, and we have already advertised another 66, that which we are prioritizing to fill in the first quarter. So um, the, we have quarterly targets, um, which we are prioritizing also taking into consideration the the capacity to be able to process the vacancies um, within a short space of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I request the DDG uh, regulatory compliance to talk to the compliance issues? Thank you, DG. Um, I believe there was just one question from Honorable Winkler. Uh, relating to the budget. Uh, in terms of the budget uh, allocation, yes, we do agree that uh, my branch has the lowest budget. What we have been doing is, as part of uh, considering exactly what the compliance and enforcement needs would uh, would be, we need to be guided by clear you know, uh, evidence to look at what are the, uh, the constraints and the capacity requirements throughout the country. We in the process of finalizing our compliance and enforcement strategy, which will take into consideration the specific uh, constraints throughout the country, uh, capacity, resources, 
also looking at it from a strategic point of view, uh, we all are aware that uh, the budget in government is quite constrained, especially on compensation. So what we're looking at is we're hoping that the compliance and enforcement strategy will guide and look at the specific needs, capacity as well. And this will then be utilized to, uh, to motivate for additional resources, specifically on compensation, uh, because as we well know, we require warm bodies on the ground in order to ensure that there's proper compliance and enforcement. However, whilst we are looking at finalizing the strategy and, and looking at uh, a possible increase in our budget, we are utilizing and leveraging of donor funding, which we received. And uh, in the donor funding, uh, we beef up a lot of our enforcement uh, capacity, uh, specifically in terms of secondments and also resources, uh, which we get from donor funds. And uh, but we need, but this is not sustainable in the long term. So we are looking at uh, motivating for additional funding, uh, operational as well as for uh, compensation budget. Uh, regarding the um, the dockets, we have approximately uh, seventy five cases that are sitting with the NPA uh, throughout the country. Uh, unfortunately, the NPA is the decision making is a bit slow, so we are dependent on the NPA to finalize and to get back to us on uh, the finalization of those dockets. Thank you, DG. I don't, I'm not sure if I missed any other questions. Thank you. DDG, can I request that you also comment on our involvement in terms of the Teguini matter uh, as part of enforcement? So in terms of the Etiquini method, DG, we are, our team are working together with uh, the other respondents, specifically in terms of responding to the, uh, the issues that have been raised as part of the court case. Uh, prior to that particular case uh, against Etiquini, my team were already in the process of a number of enforcement uh, actions, which uh, was raised as part of the uh, court matter. And this was brought to the attention of the applicants as well. We in the process via the uh, respective parties to consider how Etiquini can be brought into compliance. And uh, these issues have already been raised as part of the compliance and enforcement initiative. And we also are of the same mind as part of the action against Etiquini is to bring them into compliance because we had huge concerns regarding their non-compliance DG. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we get options and calls to uh, comment on the... Uh water testing and also the oceans master plan and various other matters. Thank you, uh, DG. Uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable members again. On the water quality issue, the water quality, this water quality program has been running for the last two or three years. So the sites, the majority of the sites have been identified previously. And the idea behind it was to really screen the flows to the estuarine and near shore ocean area to pick up what is the pathway of pollutants, uh, heavy metals, nutrients that are getting to the estuaries and to the near shore area? So the 30 of the 40 sites have been established already. We do have some flexibility with the additional 10 sites that we are targeting for this um, coming financial year, and that we can, um, we can develop with the coastal provinces. Uh, the overwhelming issue in our discussions with the Etiquini has really been the, the sewage infrastructure and the damage during the floods. Uh, and that's masking a lot of the flows at the moment. But what the monitoring program, if assistance is needed, we could track uh, improvement of water qualities as the infrastructure builds up. But the real intention of this was to pick up where the hotspots um, at flows and midway that are getting uh, to the down to the estuaries in the near shore area. That's for the water quality. Then the, the second aspect is the ocean's economy. Uh, so the team um, has, um, around each of the sectors mentioned, they have task teams and working groups that really develop implementation plans over the next few years. And implementation plans come down to 
uh, investments from national departments or investments that the sector national departments are targeting together with the sector industries. Uh, and so the implementation plan is currently being developed uh, with the task teams. Um, so chair asked about carrot and stick. So, so far, we're trying to use the carrot only. We're not sure as a coordinating department what stick we have, but the implementation plan will have commitments in around, for instance, uh, port and port infrastructure and associated industries. So we are looking for sector departments to commit to that. There's an indication of the sector department's commitment in their sector plan that was published um, earlier this year in terms of their ambition for the various aspects of either deep ocean industries or near shore and port services. Thank you, DG. Thank you. Um, can I request DDG, BNC, to, to respond to the issues? Thanks, uh, DG. I had one question from Honorable Gancho around increasing the capacity of previously disadvantaged uh, individuals in our capacity building initiatives. I take it that this relates to the biodiversity economy program that we have. And uh, Honorable Gancho will know that uh, the interventions that we are implementing are quite specialized related to the biodiversity economy areas. Um, and for the next, for this financial year, we're looking at training about 400 of those uh, beneficiaries in different types of accredited training uh, to allow these individuals to then participate in a number of um, biodiversity, related, biodiversity economy related um, um, initiatives um, across the, the country. This may relate to specialized services around um, 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 hunting related industries such as uh, leather tanning treatment, taxidermy services, uh, bioprospecting, uh, in terms of the selection of what type of plants to, that can be planted for various uses uh, or otherwise business enterprises. So it's quite a variety of um, accredited trainings that we provide uh, to the uh, identified beneficiaries, largely youth and uh, women uh, are those people that we then target. So this particular program uh, comes out of the, the training program comes out of the biodiversity economy strategy. We intend to sustain it um, and members, honorable members will recall that our biodiversity economy strategy goes up to 2030. We are currently reviewing it so that we can enhance some of its elements, especially in relation to what has emerged out of uh, the high level panel as one example, the white paper also, and uh, members will also know that we do have a focus on transformation also. So um, the revision of that particular strategy will help us in ensuring that um, having implemented some of the training, uh, in this uh, um, MTSF, we will sustain it up to 2030, uh, which is the horizon for our biodiversity economy strategy. Thank you. Thank you, DDG. Can we get DDG EP to respond? Uh, I think DDG EP and waste around the training uh, and also of uh, councillors. Um, accredited training and also how we we ensure that uh, we capacitating uh, the local government sphere in as far as the uh, um, uh, waste management is concerned. Thank, thank you, DG. Um, with regard to the training that we offer to councillors and municipal officials, it is also needs driven. So usually in the first quarter, we, we engage through um, the platforms that we have, um, our integrated um, governance uh, relations uh, structures. We do have a uh, district uh, waste management forums as well as provincial waste management forums that form part of the MinTech and MinMEC Min structures. So in terms of um, the key areas that are prioritized or 
municipalities usually put forward. Uh, it's with regard to um, their responsibilities, legislative responsibilities uh, with regard to waste management and what is required with regard to um, the designation of, of waste management officers. Um, also um, the integration of waste pickers. I think um, it was an issue that was raised by one of the honorable members. Uh, waste pickers also play a significant role in terms of um, diverting recyclables away from landfill and um, some of the municipalities, um, they struggle in terms of how do they integrate them. We do have a, a guidelines and the, the training also focuses on that. Um, the tariff um, setting, um, because um, one of the tariffs um, at local government also responds to a cost recovery uh, with regard to provision of um, uh, waste services. So um, the, how they could um, set the tariffs, there is a, 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 a focus on that. Waste characterization in terms of um, the, the waste that is being generated in, in, in the respective municipalities, and how do they go into analyzing that waste uh, and informing uh, the information that they get from the analysis, informing uh, the type of infrastructure that is required to manage waste in, in the particular municipality. So that is also part of what is considered. Also the waste bylaws, um, we do have a model bylaws that we have developed as a department. And, and, and the training also focuses on that. Um, integrated waste management plans that each uh, municipality needs to have um, in terms of um, the requirements um, of uh, those plans, what needs to be covered is also part of uh, the, the, the training. In terms of um, what is, we, we don't only focus on um, training, but also look into other aspects of uh, waste management that needs to be covered. Um, we, we've also worked with other departments, um, in this case, National Treasury, um, Cooperative Governance, and of late uh, human settlements. Um, there are uh, grants uh, that are part of the division of revenue. Um, and, and lately, um, they have been reviewed. Uh, one example is on the municipal infrastructure grant uh, to ensure that if that grant also provides for um, the, the procurement of vehicles uh, that are necessary for um, managing uh, the waste services, the trucks, as well as the landfill compactors, um, the front end loaders, uh, that usually assists with clearing of illegal dumps and so on. So with human settlements also, uh, especially on the urban development grant, um, that also we, we have seen reviews because previously uh, those grants did not allow for utilization of those grants uh, for, for, for the yellow fleet uh, used. And then the, the other question related to Okay, who who um, pays for this? Um, this uh, training we do it collaboratively with uh, Salga, and uh, uh, between us, the department and Salga, because um, as part of um, also um, our managing the the relations with municipalities and provinces, um, we 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 make uh, the training as well as ensure that. Um, the, the municipalities received. So it's an on the job training, ensuring that they are able to understand what is required and uh, what they need to be delivering to fulfill uh, their mandate. The other question was on the disposable diapers in terms of what are we doing? So we, we currently in this year, um, we are working um, to develop a, a strategy but before going into the strategy, we need to um, also analyze uh, the situation. Um, 
we're talking about adsorbent uh, hygiene products. So, so the disposable diapers is one of those, as well as the adult, uh, the feminine care products. Um, there are options that we could consider, but what the message that we are wanting to drive is that refuse collection needs to be there because um, the diapers um, that have been used um, is part of the waste that needs to be collected. But we know that some of the areas are, are facing challenges. So um, the consideration would also be to look into whether we need to prioritize this waste stream uh, because there are other alternative uh, products that could be used, uh, the reusable towel nappies and so on, but it's it's part of what would be considered as part of the strategy development and the action plan. And we will also be taking that into consultation. Um, and this project is for 12 months, so it will only be starting now. And we are signing off um, the work plans now. Thank you, DG. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thanks, uh, DDG. Uh, chemicals and Waste Management. Can we have DDG EP? Thank you, Tiji. Based on or building from what uh, DDG Masekene has shared um, in terms of training, specifically on waste management, I would like to highlight that the department, as part of the sector coordinator for the environment sector, has a local government support strategy within which we work closely with provinces and in particular with SAGA on not only on training, uh, for example, the detail that we've just received, training on, 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 on waste management. We do work with SALCA and also the municipalities in terms of providing training on other areas that are um, 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 uh, part of the mandate of the department, for example, on climate change, on conservation, air quality, and also on compliance and enforcement. So in that regard, I also would like to highlight that as part of the local government support strategy, the department as is, 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 is a coordinator and lead for the sector also goes beyond training. So the department is part of assisting municipalities in terms of understanding and also being better able to execute their environmental management mandate. We have placed officials, local government support officials across the municipalities that are support, supported by youth um, in the different municipalities, just to make sure that we, um, from a capacity perspective, we partner with municipalities, not only in terms of training, but also making sure that they have the warm bodies located that can be of assistance. And also we work closely as part of, or within the local government support strategy in terms of implementing a range of projects um, within the portfolio of the department. So in this regard, I just want to also emphasize that it's the partnership with SALCA that is critical. And across the different trainings, we partner with SALCA in terms of co-funding, but also in terms of just making sure that when we identify the priorities and also the participants for those training, we don't do it on our own as a department. We work closely with SALCA and we do our best also in terms of involving municipalities. For example, when it comes to recruiting the capacity, the local government support capacity that is there or is made available by, by the department to assist them. So the training um, DG goes beyond um, a, a just waste management. And the training in this regard is in line and is informed by the local government support strategy. Thank you, DG. Thank you very much, uh, DDG. Can we have then forestry? Uh, thank you, um, uh, DG. Uh, in terms of the question that was asked whether we do interact with the climate change uh, program, the answer is yes, we work very closely with them. Um, in recognition of the role that the forests have in terms of uh, climate change uh, mitigation. So within the branch, we have a, a unit that deals with a policy, forestry policy uh, management, and that is the unit that interacts directly um, with the climate change um, a, a branch, where we look at um, the strategies and the work that we can do as forestry to try and uh, bring in the sector, but also the, the activities within the branch that support a, a climate change uh, related uh, matters. Thank you, Tiji. Thank you, DDG. Um, DDG Middleton, I'm not quite sure whether you had any issues uh, to respond to. 
on fisheries and MLRF? Um, DG, there were no uh, fisheries directed questions um, that I'm aware of. Uh, maybe it's because Honorable Paulson's not in the meeting. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair. Gigi, it's through you, Chair. I'm back. Oh, thanks, uh, Minister. I think, thank you, Minister. I think there were issues uh, on the climate um, uh, around the extent at which, to which we, we engage very closely with uh, DMRE uh, around the issues of the just transition and also the uh, labor in terms of its um, um, uh, implementation and the plan itself, the extent at which as a department, uh, the work that we have done. And, and of course, I think uh, the PCC has been very instrumental in as far as that is concerned. I think the member, if I understood Honorable Winkler very well, was um, um, requesting for an indication on to what extent do we have discussions across government uh, in as far as just transition is concerned. So that's one of the critical area. Um, the other one, Minister um, Honorable Weber possibly is going to, uh, has indicated that she is going to send a written question around the SACWIS, the 15 priority areas, but uh, her interest is on Kendall. Uh, in terms of whether they are reporting and uh, if they are not on SACWIS, uh, how are they reporting uh, in relation to their emissions? Um, and uh, um, also if there's any notification, uh, and I'm, I was hoping that uh, compliance would have responded to this, no other uh, notification that have been, do we have notification that have been issued to any other power station uh, in relation to uh, air quality uh, compliance. I think those were the matters. There's also an issue on uh, the US dollar, 80 million target, uh, which we are um, targeting uh, for the year 23, 24. The details around that is what uh, members, and I think Chloe is back in the meeting. Uh, he can be in a position to then uh, highlight what exactly are the sources and where, what are those programs? Um, and do the funds flow directly to the department? And I think Chloe, you will clarify that it's various institutions, including entities and also DFIs in as far as the donor funding is concerned. But I think Chloe can just elaborate on the 80 uh, million. Th those are the matters, uh, man Minister. So, I think that let's agree on the SACWIS and on the Kendall will await the written question um, <clears throat> because I'm sure we would need to do some research on that matter. Um, Chloe can answer on the 80 million. On the just transition, um, honorable members would know that the just transition is located in the presidency, uh, not with our department and the president the presidency coordinates the implementation of the just transition. But what I can share with the honorable member is that <clears throat> um, after the uh, JET IP was handed over to the, um, to the partners in November last year in Egypt, uh, the the JET IP document was handed to the Climate Commission to facilitate um, public consultation on the plan. And um, what, what um, Honorable Weber should also know is that a number of ministers are commissioners. So I am a commissioner. I, I attend, um, the, I attend uh, the PCC meetings, uh, Minister Mantashe is a commissioner, Minister Ibrahim Patel, uh, the new Minister of Energy, um, Minister, the new, the new Minister and the President, Minister Nchaveni, Minister Gordon. There are, there are a number of ministers who are commissioners and, and we attend 
the Climate Commission meetings. Um, there was a workshop on Friday um, where uh, the Climate Commission was concluding feedback on the um, JET IP. And um, my understanding at that workshop is that um, I did leave, I left the, the PCC because I had to travel. Um, but um, the, the PCC is planning to hand over comment to the presidency. And I'm sure in, in due course, um, the portfolio committee could invite the PCC to give feedback on, on the, um, the consultation that was done around the, the JET IP. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, DG. Let me hand over to Clue uh, so that he can just um, talk about the 80 million. Thank you. Co yeah, Commissioner thank you. Minister, Commissioner Minister, are you aware that I'm still in charge? Uh, I, I thought you'd outsourced um, to the DG to answer all questions, but um, it's, it's always through you, Chair. I wouldn't dare do anything else. Yeah, well, I was shocked that you are taking over, Minister. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. DG, are you, you have proven you can't be borrowed power. Uh, but that's fine. Can we get clarity on the 80 million and we break? Thank you, Chair, and thank you. Um, on the question on the US $80 million, Chair, this is... Uh, uh, mobilized through, among other sources, bilateral sources where we'll have bilateral engagement with some of the donor countries such as uh, Germany and, and Flanders and, and many others. And it is also through multilateral finance mechanism where through our participation in these structures, we ensure that our accredited entities uh, in this regard for adaptation fund, we have SANVI that has been accredited to adaptation fund, will be able to access resources for implementation. Uh, and on the GCF, we have, of course, um, uh, SANVI and the DBSA as our direct accredited entities, they are also able to access uh, funding. And these resources, uh, honorable members, uh, they do not necessarily flow through uh, the department, they go through, uh, among other things, accredited entities to fund programs uh, on ground. Thank you, DG, over to you. Back to your chair. Yeah, that is what I wanted to, to say, uh, Mr. Ramar. You can't give, you, you people of the department are just exchanging power to one another. My apology, chair. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Honorable members, I suppose, oh, DG, your end is up. Yes, Chair, there's just two uh, questions I think uh, members uh, raised. I think uh, Honorable Weber uh, uh, was uh, questioning the various accredited training that we have as a department and why are we not necessarily pulling all those funding to then uh, uh, fund the frozen uh, posts so that we then beef up capacity in as far as the department is concerned. I think what I want to highlight there is that um, as various departments, uh, National uh, Treasury uh, has set a ceiling in as far as personal costs are concerned. So we can only have posts up to a particular cap and not beyond and, and we, do not necessarily have a leeway. Even if we can have resources, we need to go back and sit down with a very clear strategy with National Treasury on how do we work around ensuring that we live within the ceiling. So that is what we do on a continuous basis as we go from year to year in terms of ensuring that we uh, unlock the frozen, the frozen post. The, the other one, Chair, was from yourself in relation to the consultation with DPME, AGSA doing a proactive review on our APP. Is it necessarily going to uh, show an improvement? Uh, Chair, um, we are hoping, in fact, that's why we have requested that they 
um, proactively uh, uh, review so that by the time we finalize the APP, we have taken into uh, uh, consideration their comments. However, the actual issues normally arise in implementation. So we still have a responsibility as a department to monitor very closely the actual implementation of these various indicators uh, of the APP and achievement of the target. And that must have a very clear portfolio of evidence if you have made an impact on the ground in terms of that achievement. So that's an area which uh, is actually uh, even steeper, but we are working uh, uh, very hard on it to ensure that then we improve as a department in terms of implementation. Uh, I think that's about it, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members. It is now half past one. Can we take a break and reconvene at two o'clock? Chair. Minister. Can I just, um, Chair, I just wanted to ask if you have finished with our department and our DDGs, could I request that they be excused so that they can go and attend to their, their jobs um, while we deal with the entities? Uh, we are done with the department, uh, Minister. When we reconvene, we are going straight to South African National Parks and uh, Ismangalis. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and as such, we can release uh, other officials of the department. Thank you, Chair. How long are we going to take for our lunch chair? 30 minutes till two o'clock. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Colleagues, I realized that I got cut. Uh, did you hear me, Minister Chris? Yes, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Ninga go to.
Recording stopped.
2015, and she is now uh, the newly appointed uh, CEO. And before, at some point, she was acting CEO and was um, in attendance at this committee. Uh, in the interest of time, Chair, I'm not going to introduce all our members, safely to say that the, the ones that we are probably seeing from the first time, it would be um, uh, the, the, the acting CFO, Ms. Rebecca uh, Pile, as well as Mr. Oskam Timkulu, who is uh, the head of or the ME Kruger National Park. But the rest of the MEs are in attendance and uh, they will be assisting in answering questions as the CEO uh, so um, asks, or, <clears throat> or maybe the CEO will handle all the questions, but it will up to, up to her. But just to say that, Chair, that uh, as, as, as the Sand Parks Board, would, uh, we are pleased to present the APP, uh, which is um, uh, the contribution, our contribution as an organization to this last year of the current administration. Uh, just a couple of points to note that we are in still in our recovery path as, um, as, as, as an organization uh, post COVID. So we have, uh, at the same time, we are noting the improvements which we had covered in uh, when we came to present quarter three and quarter four. So we are on, on a growth trajectory and which in itself has led to a little bit more um, things that we are, we are doing in this APP um, or in this financial year, but we are not out of the woods yet. Um, we have also um, in the presentation would cover things like how we link with the rest of government program and, and I think just quick specific areas, uh, um, uh, honorable chair and members, is that uh, we want to strengthen our efforts uh, in terms of uh, tourism recovery and growth. And that it's linked to our investment in infrastructure, the department and the minister had been uh, kind and, and given us additional resources uh, to improve uh, for, for infrastructure investment, which really contributes to uh, visitor experience in our national parks, but also uh, help us to maintain existing infrastructure. And also we are in this uh, APP starting to also include our own contribution towards the implementation of the newly approved uh, white paper on uh, biodiversity and sustainable use. Uh, we continue our efforts uh, of strengthening wildlife crime, which is a matter that was dealt with at the beginning of the session. Just to make a comment there, Chair, uh, uh, as, 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 as Sand Parks, you had asked us if we, when we present, we could comment that uh, we, um, with the Rademeyer report, one uh, would like to say that uh, we've noted the report and we are in the process of studying it and processing it and looking at in more detail where we can, um, uh, given the fact that I think uh, through Mr. Rademeyer's own admission that, uh, that it is not uh, Kruger National Park is not an isolated uh, um, uh, site of crime, and 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 that we also this is all part linked to organized crime, which means then, as we prepare our response, uh, we also need to link it with other law enforcement agencies and other parties that we are working with, uh, and and also noting that um, he did indicate that there had been a a positive reception from our part. However, we would like to request that uh, we provide a comprehensive uh, a response at a, a date to be determined by the committee. That those would be our comments on that report and um, uh, uh, honorable chair. And then finally, we're also looking at how do we strengthen our capacity as an organization because uh, we're only able to deliver on the work of the APP and our mandate if we have um, a, a, a capable organization, both in terms of systems, processes, and also capable staff. 
And uh, noted within that is issues of staff morale. Those things are all part of our priority areas that we are looking at in the APP. So without further ado, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Recording in progress. With your permission, I'm going to request then the, 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 the CEO to start presentation, I think from slide nine, because I think in my summary, I covered the slides before that. And um, over to you, Ms. Sill. Good afternoon, um, and, and thank you for that introduction, Chairperson. Um, good afternoon to Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, the DG. Chair. Chair. The picture is not clear. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I suspect I suspect honorable members want to see you uh, see or so that they can yes uh, it, it looks like my screen is a bit blurred I'm just trying to resolve that quickly it looks better I think it does yes okay. thank you thank you I'll just go back and start my greeting again. Um, Honourable Chair, and good afternoon to you and Honourable Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, the DG, uh, Chairperson of Sandbox and Chairperson of other entities in this meeting today, um, the board members of Sandbox and other entities with us today, as well as the colleagues in general. Um, as the chairperson has indicated, she would like for me to begin my presentation straight into the APP. And um, that's, that's what we have in front of us. Can I go to the next slide? I'm going to skip, uh, with your permission, chairperson nine, uh, number 10, um, because number 10 just speaks to the mission and the vision. Number 11 is also sharing information that you're relatively familiar with in terms of our locations um, and the number of employees we have in, in our parks. Um, I will also skip this slide as I trust that you are familiar with it, our context, which includes our mandate. Um, this slide uh, summarizes the four outcome goals in our uh, APP, outcome goal number one, being sustainable biodiversity and cultural heritage. Outcome goal two, improve diverse responsible tourism. Outcome goal three, speaks to sustainable. Uh, thank you. Socioeconomic transformation. And outcome goal four is a very broad outcome, as you know, and it speaks to transform, trans, transformed organization through revenue, people, uh, systems and business processes. Um, next slide, please. I will also skip this slide. Uh, the chairperson has covered this, I believe, fairly adequately. Um, can I go to the next slide? Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, outcome goal number one. And outcome goal number one, um, I will take you through our, our, our indicators under sub outcome one, which is protected area expansion. Um, in this financial year, we aim to add 7,000 hectares to our national parks. Uh, with regards to sub outcome goal number two, which is effective and efficient management of national parks, we intend to assess um, 20 national parks and aim to achieve a med score of 80% uh, minimum. We'll also assess six marine protected areas and 33% of those we intend to ensure that they achieve a med score of 
more than 67%. Uh, with regards to the indicator of um, implementation of policies on elephant, rhino, lion, and leopard, and that is related to the outcomes of the high level panel. We will have a policy support implementation plan developed in this year and also ensure that 70% of our activities with regards to that implementation plan are, are implemented. And this will be a cumulative, a cumulative number. Sub outcome uh, goal number three, degraded ecosystems rehabilitated. In this period, we intend to rehabilitate 25,200 initial hectares. Um, we then will follow that up with 139,500 uh, hectares to be rehabilitated. Um, with regards to the wetlands, the intention is for us to rehabilitate 7,200 cubic meters of wetlands. Next slide, please. Um, we move on to sub outcome number four, which is climate change vulnerability, uh, reduced and climate resilience improved. We intend to, to um, assess two national parks for climate change vulnerability, um, as well as two national parks with regards to climate change adaptation and making sure that those are included in the park management plans um, and ensure that we have priority actions for climate change adaptation identified for two parks. Um, we intend to implement 90% of the annual green energy implementation plan in this year. With regards to sub outcome five, which is a framework towards improved management of cultural heritage, um, we intend to assess two national parks with regards to its cultural heritage resources, as well as ensure that we implement 90% of the annual cultural heritage uh, action plan. Next slide, please. Uh, we're still on outcome goal number one, sub outcome eight, sustainable populations of species of special concern monitored and increased. With regards to our rhino population, um, we, we have a target wherein we are ensuring that we will increase rhino population in identified core rhino areas at a percentage which is greater than 1% per annum. And this is with specific reference to Kruger National Park. In other parks, uh, and we have six other rhino parks, we intend to push the rhino population growth uh, at a four percentage um, growth level. With regards to number of rhinos poached in Kruger National Park, as well as the six other rhino parks, we intend to reduce the number of rhinos poached in KNP to under 120 for the year, and the other six rhino parks to ensure that the number of rhinos poached is less than five animals. With regards to elephants, the target there is to reduce the number of elephants poached to 40 animals uh, or less, um, reduce, and with, the, with regards to the other four, Parks that we monitor, we reduce the number of elephants poached to less than four. Next slide, please. We move on to outcome goal two, which is improved diverse responsible tourism. Um, sub outcome seven, which is improve, improved tourism performance. Our annual target under customer satisfaction index rating. Uh, we we are aiming at a 0.5% improvement on customer satisfaction. We intend to have an 11% growth uh, on the number of visitors uh, to our national parks year on year. And uh, percentage increase in terms of accommodation occupancy, we are targeting 0.6% uh, 
up on the previous year. We are targeting to implement eight new and diverse tourism products. Uh, with regards to integrated marketing and communications plans and the number of interventions that we will roll out coming out of that plan, we've identified six marketing interventions, five communications interventions. Uh, we also have interventions that we are planning for improved hospitality service delivery standards, and uh, the target there is two interventions. Next slide, please. Um, outcome, sub outcome goal eight, improve responsible tourism. We intend to assess six national parks using our responsible tourism auditing framework. Next slide, please. We are moving on to outcome goal three, which is sustainable social economic development. Um, sub outcome. Goal nine, the transformation of wildlife economy through increased PDI participation. Um, regarding the number of animals to be delivered to communities and individual emerging game farmers, our target for this year is 600 animals. With regards to the number of full-time equivalent employment um, created through EPWP, the target is 5,140 FTEs. Um, the next uh, indicator is a breakdown of those jobs um, that will be created through EPWP with the youth. We're targeting 5,160 with women in EPW program, 4,580 and people with disabilities, uh, 145 is our target. Sub outcome 10, improved participation of PDIs in the business of sand parks. Um, the number of SM SMMEs contracted for provision of goods and services through EPWP. Our target is 450 SMMEs. Um, then we also have a target with regard to percentage of goods and services contracted to EMEs and QSEs. And our target is that 40% of all annual goods and services contracted to EMEs, and that 15% of annual goods and services will be um, procured through QSEs, and that is in specific reference to procurement that is below 1 million. Um, next slide. Um, we look at sub outcome. Goal 11, which is improved participation. It is a continuation of the previous one. Um, we are also tracking the percentage of expenditure on affirmative procurement, and this year's target is 80% of procurement will be spent on designated groups. Um, sub outcome goal 12 increased access to education and skills development opportunities. We are targeting uh, to train more than 120 beneficiaries from targeted groups. In addition, we are intending to ensure that more than four, 450 schools are able to access our national parks for educational purposes. Next slide. Um, this is sub outcome 13, which is our sustained corporate social investment toward community development. We have a target for the number of individual communities where social legacy projects have been completed, and these are six communities. Uh, sub outcome 14, improved participation of land claimants in St. Park's business. Um, our target in terms of um, our claim and beneficiation schemes being developed and implemented. 30% of activities in the Cochrane Land Claim Beneficiation Package annual plan will be implemented in this, in this financial year, as well as 30% of activities in the um, ADO Land Claim annual implementation plan will be implemented in this financial year. Uh, next slide. I move on to outcome goal number four, which is sustain, sustainable and transformed organization through revenue people, systems, and business processes. 
The sub outcome number 15, we talk about financial sustainable organization. Uh, we have a target of 120 million for revenue raise through resource mobilization. Uh, we are aiming at a 20% increase in our actual 2022-23 um, revenue raised through tourism performance. And we're aiming at 4 million rand um, as a revenue target for wildlife sales. With regards to sub outcome 16, transformed in capable human capital, we are targeting 41% of women in management positions. Uh, we are intending to increase the percentage of people with disabilities uh, employed by Sandparks by 1.1% and to increase the number of Black people uh, as a percentage of management to 64%. Next slide. Um, as sub outcome 17, transformed and capable human capital, we intend to spend 1% of our percent, the percentage of payroll on skills development programs. Um, our human capital management strategy, we intend to implement it at least 80% of the annual operational plan. Um, and we intend to introduce 80% um, of the initiatives that we we have in in our 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 program for performance management or change enhancing the culture of performance management 80% of those initiatives that have been identified will be implemented in this financial year we will run eight annual wellness interventions in this year towards the management of employee health and well-being next slide and with regards to sub outcome 18, which is efficient and innovative systems, uh, we will implement one cyber control um, in this financial year. Um, with regards to sound corporate governance and qualified audit opinion um, is, is, is our annual target. We intend to implement a minimum of 75% of the approved internal audit plan and to reflect a 95% implementation of the approved ERM maturity improvement and annual implementation plan, as well as achieving level five of maturity rating. We will implement 95% of uh, our ethics maturity improvement and annual implementation plan in this year as well, as well as ensuring that we implement 100% of our integrated compliance monitoring and reporting systems. Uh, next slide, we are aiming to have 75,000 or more free entrants to our Sandparks week this year, which happens in September. And under sub outcome 21, appropriate and well-maintained infrastructure, the intention is to implement 90% of our annual infrastructure program um, Next slide. The, the next slide speaks to strategic risks, which are relatively self-explanatory, and I will not go through them uh, with your permission, Chair. Uh, I'd like to then go straight to the budget and uh, request the acting CEO, um, Ms. Rebecca Pile, to, to present uh, the budget for, for this financial year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I suspect you wanted to say the acting CFO. I said the acting CFO. Oh, yes, the acting CFO. Sorry. Uh, CEO, you are so you are so used to acting. It's okay. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Apologies, Miss 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 Pilly, uh, Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. And um, afternoon, honourable chair, honourable members. Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, and colleagues, I will take you through our budget for 23-24. If we look at our total revenue, we're sitting just under um, 4 billion, which is represented by 60% of self-generated revenue of 2.3 billion and non-exchange revenue of 40%, which is 1.5 billion. 
Overall, our revenue has increased by 27% when we compare to the same uh, to the budget last year, where we were just um, uh, just over three billion rand uh, budget for revenue. If we can go to the next slide, please. So included in the uh, budget for revenue, we also have a 700 million that was allocated as a grant from DFFE. This will greatly assist it specifically for our infrastructure maintenance. We also have projected increases in most of our revenue streams, which, um, which is due to a projection of more visitors visiting our parks. And um, yeah, so that's our revenue budget. If you look at our uh, performance over the years, sorry, if you can just thank you. If you look at our performance over the years, with the green being the budget for 23, 24, you, you can see that it has increased compared to the prior year and specifically in the 21, 22 year where, we're, where we were impacted by COVID. So although not there yet, we are making uh, a turn towards, um, you know, improving on, on our revenue generation. If we look at the expenditure side, um, if you can just move please. We have covered this uh, one. If you can just go to the graphs, next one. Thank you. If you look at our expenditure, our expenditure is projected at 3.8 billion. That will be the first slide that we've passed um, already. With the biggest cost drivers being human resources and operating costs, human resources, which contribu contributes to 44%, which is 1.5 billion, and operating cost of 1.1 billion uh, towards our total expenditure of 3.8 billion. We also have, if we compare our budget uh, of, if we compare our budget for last financial year, we are we have increased our expenditure budget by 14%, mainly due to increased maintenance cost, and that will be you can see it is it has increased from the prior year by 42%, uh, mainly resulting from the exp expenditure we expected to incur for the increased uh, grant from DFFE. We also have operational expenditure, which has increased. Uh, now that we're expecting to um, you know, move towards better uh, tourism generation and um, a performance of sand parks, we have increased our operating expenses by 14% due to ongoing commitments, uh, fuel costs, and other day-to-day um, um, -day expenditure. Thanks, um, thanks members. It is our budget. I have covered this. Thank you. Honorable members, that is the presentation of South African National Parks. Uh, may I invite you to engage them? Uh, Honorable Weber, you'll be the first. Honorable Bryant, you'll be the second. Okay, proceed, Honorable Weber. Thank you, Chair. Um, I only have two questions. Um, the one first question was sort of answered by the acting CFO, and that was when you showed um, the 11% increase in the number of visitors to the park, my question would have been, how does that compare? to before COVID. So I would like to see where we are now and where we were because the revenue just showed me that we're not yet there where we were. And I would like to know how far we are from before COVID came so that we can pick up on that. Then my second question is, I was, and it's maybe inappropriate, but I do want to ask the following. We had presentations on 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 Kruger National Park specifically, but one of the biggest issues in all our parks is security. Now I look at your budget items and it's maintenance and it's administration and it's operational. Now I presume that um, security uh, is falling under operation. So I put a request for forward that. Can we maybe make a budget item for security, finances and budget for security, that we can see in context exactly where our security and financing for that stands? Because that is why we have the parks is for tourism. And 
if the security of the animals are not there and they're poached and everything, we have a problem and, and then tourism won't come. So I would like to see in comparison to all the other uh, line items where security is standing and how much money really goes into security. It might be my fault. I just look now at that five items that um, the acting CFO gave us. But that's a request from my side that we separately can deal with the security and see what that all entails and how much money goes to that. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Honorable Weber, Honorable Brian. Thanks very much, Chairperson. And uh, let me also just take the opportunity to congratulate uh, the new CEO. Um, I also believe she is the first uh, first female CEO of Sand Parks. Um, so really hearty congratulations. And I know you have a big task ahead of you, um, but uh, we will certainly uh, do our best to support you uh, uh, where we can. Um, Chairperson, I know uh, one gets confused with acting uh, I know you, you yourself were acting as a dear person for a long time. Um, so <laughs> at least we don't have to have the acting anymore. Um, the more of the acting uh, titles we can, we can uh, do away with, I think the better. Uh, certainly makes things a bit easier. Um, so Ms. Yako, you, you mentioned that um, Sand Parks uh, is going to provide a comprehensive response to the Rademeyer report. Um, that's fantastic. Um, and as you mentioned, we just need to settle on a date for that. Chairperson, um, I would request then, um, as per um, Ms. Yarko's um, offer to provide that uh, comprehensive response uh, to, to Mr. Rademacher's report, um, if we can set that down for a date and also ensure, as was discussed earlier this morning, that uh, the uh, representatives from the South African Police Service and potentially the South African uh, police service, uh, the, the, the committee um, on policing also be invited uh, to, that, to that meeting. Um, I know this is something that, I've, that I've, I've, I've raised on many occasions before, and I'm, I'm sure I'm probably being uh, a little bit uh, irritating with this one, but uh, we still firmly believe that the target for rhino poaching should be zero. I, I, I think it is good that those numbers are going down and that your targets are, are lower. Um, one hopes that it's, 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 it's because the, the uh, rates of poaching is dropping and not merely the numbers. But we really should be looking at a zero total. That should be the KPI is zero. And uh, any, any rhinos that are poached, uh, be it in KMP or anywhere else, um, should, should take us into the red. It's the only way we're really going to start focusing uh, 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 properly um, on ensuring that we root out corruption and poaching uh, of rhino. Um, as unrealistic as it might appear at present, that should be our target, should be zero. Um, I just want to find out in terms of the budget, um, we have found out that there were 87 ranger posts vacant last year. Five of those have apparently been filled. We're still sitting with 82, although I see some other interviews have been conducted uh, to uh, employ additional rangers. But I just want to find out um, if that budget provision um, is sufficient uh, to cover those remaining 82 ranger posts. Um, I mean, they have been identified and it is a, a serious issue. Um, so I just want to find out if the budget covers those 82 remaining range of posts. Um, and then just a question, uh, Mr. Rodimer mentioned that around about 86% of staff are currently staying outside Kruger National Park at present. Um, but we see that uh, around about 10 million is being spent on staff accommodation. I'm just trying to reconcile those two numbers. Is that uh, money being spent on building the new accommodation um, or, or the improved accommodation? Or, or, or what is that that number? Because uh, it seems a little bit, uh, the two things don't seem to match up. Um, do we have a number of how many staff are currently staying inside KMP? Um, and I think that's it for now. Thanks very much, Chair and CEO. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Brian, Honorable Winkler. Uh, thank you to the chairperson and thank you for the report. 
So uh, the first question I have regards the number of parks assessed for climate change vulnerabilities. Um, as part of the vulnerability assessments, is there a component that deals with the probability, um, increasing probability of doubt as we see uh, severe climate impacts? Because obviously this speaks to the management of populations in these reserves. Um, with regard to the annual green energy implementation plan, what does that exactly speak to as well? Um, if we could just get some clarity on that. Um, when you say that the rhino population is increasing at greater than 1% per annum, so how is this benchmark derived? Um, and is this the only feasible uh, growth that we can look at in terms of rhino population and why? Um, and similarly, uh, with regard to the elephant poaching statistics, like my colleague Honorable Bryant has mentioned, um, to say that it's only been less than 40, um, it's an improvement, but it's definitely not the sort of ambition that we should be looking at. So what has sort of been implemented in terms of how to address the, the elephant poaching? Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Winkler. Uh, are there further takers, Honorable Members? Okay, can we get the responses see? Um, thank you, Chair. I'll also request um, my colleagues who are present here to, to assist with uh, some of these questions. Uh, with regards to the number of um, the increase in the number of, of visitors to parks being at 11%, uh, the question from Honorable Weber was, where are we currently? We are at 4.9 million visitors, which is um, an 80% improvement on, on a on, a, on our numbers, uh, or rather at 80% of where we were at pre-pandemic. So we, we are very comfortable that we are recovering. I'd like for um, the Exxon CFO to speak about the item of um, security not being a specific line item. Um, and I will call on Dr. Howard uh, to address issues to do with uh, the poaching targets, Dr. Howard Hendricks. Um, so there were two questions, one on the rhino population and another on the elephant. Um, and Mr. Property Mugwena to speak to the green energy implementation. Um, and Mr. Tim Kulu, who is our managing executive at Kruger National Park to speak to matters to do with the housing of stuff inside and outside of of um of Kruger. So we'll start off with um acting CFO um Ms. Pile, the issue of security being a specific line item in Thanks. our budget. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um with regards to that, remember is correct, it is not specifically uh, ring fence for security, and um, we will have to get back to you with the figure because the security figure would be sitting in employee costs, maintenance, and operating costs. Um, it is a good suggestion taken uh, for noting going forward, and it is something we can consider, but uh, it is spread, a, a spread across the different categories of expenditure, and it's not isolated to one area. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Tim Kulu, um, are you in a position to address the issue of um, the staff housing? Uh, and the question was specific to 86% um, of our rangers uh, staying outside the park. And uh, the other question being the 10 million um, that we've budgeted for staff housing. How are we going to utilize that? Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Honorable Chair, and Honorable Members, and the Minister, Honorable Minister and colleagues. Um, 
I would just want to remind honorable members that uh, during the presentation that was done this morning by Mr. Rudemeyer, he did indicate on the condition of our staff in terms of you know, working condition. And part of that is the accommodation. And, and some of you might have visited Kruger National Park and you will have realized that the kind of staff accommodation that was allocated, especially to lower rank African staff members is not acceptable. So the, the budget is really to try and accommodate, improve uh, the staff um, living condition especially for the essential services staff members who are expected to be inside the park 24 hours. So the budget that is allocated for that is ready to improve the staff accommodation to a reasonable accommodation. And this has a bearing even in terms of our transformation because of our living conditions that are found to be unacceptable. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was muted. I was requesting Mr. Mutumkulu that while he's still on on the floor, to please address the the issue of the ranger posts and whether the budget provision is sufficient to cover the filling of this of these um, vacancies. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Again, uh, the current uh, budget allocation is based on the prioritization of the position. It is currently not um, enough to fill all vacant position, but it's uh, something that we're working on to say over the years, because we have to take them for training so that we can fill those positions. They are not readily available, but uh, in terms of the budget itself, it's not sufficient to fill all position. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll... Uh, CEO, I'm not too sure if it's only me yes, or, we, or we only had Mr. Mutimu. Oh, I, I had him. He was very good. Yeah, we, we also. Oh, okay. Then, then it's fine. It's only on, it's only on my side. Let, let's proceed. Okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, I will request Mr. Mokwena to speak to the Green Energy Implementation Plan. Uh, the question being, what are the elements that are contained in that plan? And then followed uh, after that by Dr. Hendricks to speak about rhino population um, and elephant poaching. Thank you, um, CEO, and uh, good afternoon, honorable members, uh, minister and deputy minister, and uh, colleagues and all members uh, who are here. So, Sun Parks has an uh, energy efficiency uh, strategy, uh, which was approved by, by the board of Sun Parks. And it was developed by all uh, internal and external uh, stakeholders. So the strategy itself uh, demands that we need to have a, a plan in terms of uh, implementation or to, to make sure that we realize uh, that plan. So. One of the objectives of that strategy is to, uh, or that plan is to deal with the energy saving on the uh, demand side to reduce uh, the energy cost uh, of our operations. And uh, that's one uh, critical uh, part of the strategy. Uh, and then the second point of it uh, is to uh, replace replacement of uh, fossil fuels. As you will know that um, across the parks, you'll find uh, some parks not using uh, energy efficiency um, uh, mechanism or still uh, using fossil fuels. The likes of uh, Halakhad is still using uh, diesel. So is to, is to replace that with energy efficiency uh, mechanisms such as uh, solar. Uh, the third objective is to secure um, funding for the sustainability of, 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 of the plan. So we've, we've started now to, to roll out some of this uh, in some of the parks in the likes of Kalahati. I know that we'll be putting uh, some solar plants. We've installed some in uh, 
in, in Dangwa and in the KNP. So the plan uh, consists of, of those elements of, of that strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. Thank you, CE, and thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, honorable members. Um, the question around uh, climate change and uh, whether our climate vulnerability assessments, if we are able to assess increasing in the possibility of, of droughts. I think it's a very good question and thank you for that question. The way we um, perform our uh, vulnerability assessments is in fact, at um, it's a very comprehensive assessment and it's pretty much at three different levels. It is, it is obviously to understand what are the implications for climate change and what are those implications for specific, for sand parks as an organization, but more specifically, how resilient are those specific national parks to um, any form of climate change and the adaptation responses there too. But also uh, an important element of our assessments includes neighboring communities, um, including for that matter, other stakeholders. And then that the question is to ask, how do we then build climate change resilience in, in neighboring communities as well? And then I think, uh, you know, the last part is, is around the communication uh, of it. So, so Honorable Winkler, yes, the, the, the drought uh, is part of our uh, biological aspects of climate change, um, regardless of socioeconomic changes with, within our national parks and, and, and around our national parks. But certainly droughts do form part of it as much as wildfires and all those other uh, environmental uh, aspects that relate to our national parks. Whether we always spot on, whether we can say with accuracy whether a drought is going to happen, obviously our models uh, can only predict as, as accurate as the data that we have available. But yes, certainly droughts form part of that and, and many of the other environmental factors that form part of that as well. Um, CE, there was also a question around um, um, uh, is it only possible to uh, or, or one percent? Why is it only feasible? Yes, yes. Whether that is a feasible growth level? And I think how the one percent. And also, Chair, am, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, I am. But there's an echo. I was saying the part, other part of the question is how how do we determine that percentage? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, Chair, so the one percent is obviously for Kruger, and then we have a different percentage for for other parks. Um, the one percent is, uh, you'll note that the wording specifically highlighted uh, in the core areas, we've identified, um, we know more or less where the rhinos are in Kruger, we've identified uh, more or less the, the six combinations for the different uh, groupings of rhino, um, specifically in those core areas, and based on our modeling, we can quite comfortably say that we would be able to increase the population with one percent in those specific core areas once we've considered uh, possible poaching uh, events in those particular areas. So it's based on the, the modeling that we've done, based on what we know, and therefore we can quite confidently indicate that we will be growing that uh, population with 1%. Uh, you will note that um, our performances have always been slightly higher. So we anticipate it might be better, but we definitely predict a 1% growth rate in those populations in the poor areas. Thank you, CE. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. Chair, so, um, I, I trust that we had captured all the questions that we were asked. I'll be led by you. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Weber and Honorable Brian, don't follow ups. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm actually follow up on one of Honorable Brian's questions. I want to know um, if 86% of people working in, um, in sandbox are outside. And one of the benefits of actually working in the park is to have accommodation, et cetera. Who are the people living outside by choice and is the cost of living then outside the park for their own account or who is paying for them if the, 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 the accommodation is not 
viable for them inside? Who is carrying that cost? Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Weber, Honorable Brian, followed by Honorable Kancho. Thanks, Rima. Yeah, Chivas, I think it's it's unfortunate to hear that the budget hasn't been provided for those additional range of posts. Um, I wouldn't even say they're not, they're not even additional. They're, they're vacant posts. Um, and I think it is very difficult for the public to take Sandpark seriously when they say they want to combat rhino poaching, when they're not even making adequate budgetary provision to fill vacant posts that exist for rangers. Uh, rangers are the front line um, that prevent uh, these incursions and the poaching of our wild animals, not only rhino, all sorts of other animals um, and the theft of wildlife. And um, it, is, it is hard to fathom why uh, uh, Sandpox is not making that provision. And then in the same breath saying that they're comfortable with having 120 rhinos poached every year. Um, one can understand why members of the public are, are struggling to, to, um, uh, to, to uh, realign, to align themselves with those two schools of thought. Um, thanks, Chair. 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 Evo, Honorable Ganjo. Oh, Honorable Minister first. <coughs> no, uh, Chair, I will. I want to respond, uh, but take the rest of your questions first. Oh, Honorable Ganjo. Thank you, Chair. No, mine is just um, follow up on the issue of accommodation in so far as um, Kruka National Park is concerned. I know that when we last time we visited, they were busy with the construction of um, some of the houses. I just want to check um, how far are they in terms of um, the completion of the, 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 the project and um, in terms of uh, meeting uh, the completion from zero to 100 percent um, percentage would they say um, it is in terms of its completion? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kancho. Uh, Commissioner Minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Chair, I, I just want to make two points. I think the first point one wants to make is that honorable members should not forget what happened during the COVID pandemic. In 2020, in order to prevent us having to close Sand Parks as a government entity, I had to take a billion rand out of the department's budget and use that billion rand to plug the holes in the Sand Parks budget. And the reason is that historically, this has been a well-performing entity that has not been dependent on government bailouts and has generated 80% of its own revenue. Since the, the pandemic, the institution has struggled and no government institution is permitted to table a deficit budget. So what that means is that the institution has to cut its coat according to its cloth. We absolutely agree that posts, ranger posts in particular, must be filled. But it's very important for honorable members to recognize that we have not fully recovered from the pandemic yet, and we cannot run ourselves into a situation where the ratio of staff salaries to other operational costs is exceeded. Because once you do that, you can pay salaries and nothing else. There are many municipalities in our country in that situation. There are also a number of government entities in that situation. And there is a conscious decision by the leadership of Sandparks that we're not going to get into that situation. So these ranger posts have to be filled. No one is disagreeing with that. But what we are saying is that the range of posts must be filled 
at a pace that the organization can afford. Because there are many other costs which are also essential for the running of the institution. The second point I want to make is that um, uh, we have indicated we're going to give a full report, uh, response to the Radamay report. Part of what that will involve is looking at his statistics, looking at our statistics, looking at his points about accommodation, looking at our accommodation policies. And uh, we are not closed to options, but we would want an opportunity to consider the important points raised in his report and to respond in full. So I wouldn't want us to um, go extensively into that at this stage. I want us to give the institution an opportunity to consider what was put before it and then to be able to respond. Otherwise, let me hand back um, to the staff of Sandpark. Thank you. See you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, Honorable Chair, I'm just going to request um, my colleagues once again to respond very quickly to some of the questions, taking into consideration uh, what the minister has said about us coming back to, to parliament with a, a fuller uh, briefing. If um, Liz McCott, who is our COO, can take the questions regarding the housing issue. Um, and I'll also ask Mr. Mtumkulu to address the question regarding the construction and refurbishment of staff housing in the Kruger. Thank you. I believe that the, the, the minister has um, adequately responded to the question regarding the budget uh, for the ranger positions. So over to you, um, Mrs. McCourt, and then to Mr. Mtumkulu. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, CEO. Good afternoon, afternoon, Honourable Minister, Honourable Deputy Minister, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, our board members and colleagues across all of the um, the different entities still present and the department. Um, yes, Chair, um, in response to the question about the structuring of salaries and remuneration and cost of living, the um, in some of our remote parks, of course, we have most of our staff staying inside the park because there is not um, alternative accommodation um, necessary uh, available in in the in the immediate communities. Um, in other areas where there is um, accommodation available, we do focus on essential staff staying inside the park. Um, of course, the cost of living for those staying inside the park is uh, much lower than those uh, staying outside of parks, and therefore we have a different salary structure in terms of um, this, the salaries for those that are staying inside the park versus those that are staying um, outside of parks. Um, and this does not currently take into consideration the the real cost of living dynamics in the different uh, geographical areas, but it is mostly based on um, a, a type of housing allowance and travel allowance, which people would not have um, necessary when they are staying in, in the park. So we do have two pay scales, one talking to uh, people staying inside or staff staying inside of the park and the other staying outside of the park. One of the biggest socioeconomic concerns that we have in terms of people staying within parks um, their entire career is that they are often found in an undesirable position once they retire. And the inside the staff, um, inside the park, um, accommodation is therefore no longer available to them. Um, and that is one of the issues that we are considering currently in our future visions around, around staff accommodation. Just in terms of the, um, the, the 10 million allocation to, to staff housing, I must just emphasize that this is not um, earmarked at the Kruger only. 
and it is a mixture of building new accommodation and upgrading and changing the nature of um, of the accommodation. The specific project that um, Honourable Gunch was, for example, referring to was moving away from hostel type accommodations to freestanding um, housing accommodations that can include um, that can include family members um, living with the employees in in the park. So the the mix it is a mixture of new infrastructure as well as refurbishment and maintenance um, of of existing staff accommodation. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mrs. McCott. Um, Chair, we trust that we have answered the last batch of questions. Uh, Mr. McCullough, would you like to add something? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think the um, my colleague, uh, Liz, has covered uh, most of the questions that were asked. I just wanted to add from Kruger National Park perspective that in the 2021-22 financial year, we upgraded around about 129 staff units. And in the last financial year, which is 2022-23, we upgraded about 50 um, staff accommodation units. So these are just the existing where we are grading from a hostel, um, hostel communal ablution setup to a more uh, respectful and um, dignified uh, accommodation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mtimkul. Uh, Honorable Chair, um, we have responded to the questions. Thank you. Did you, did you hear the question of Honorable Kancho? Yes, Chair. Our understanding was that um, it's, it's the, the response that Mr. Mtumkulu has just heard, uh, has just shared with us, which is uh, which was regarding the construction of, of homes and the refurbishment of homes, unless there's a section of the question I missed, uh, Honorable Chair. Okay. Uh, well, if she's satisfied, she won't come back. Honorable Brian? No, I wanted to, to check... Um, in terms of its completion, ne? I know that there are pieces of refurbishment and all that, but at, at some point we need to just finish you know, the project. The, the, how far are you with that in, in terms of, of, of completing this project? We can't just build forever. Thank you, Chair. Okay, please note that, Honorable Bryant. Thanks very much, Chair. Just on a, a slightly uh, a different tack, if, if I may, while we have Sandpox here, just a very quick one. Um, I know as a result of those terrible fires that happened on Table Mountain two years ago, uh, there was a lot of devastation and destruction. Um, the Mostert's Mill has been rebuilt and it's looking fantastic. I know there was a private group that uh, uh, put money together and, and had that repaired. But the old tea room, um, which uh, is a, a very important tourist attraction uh, for all of those visiting uh, Table Mountain on the Rose Memorial side, um, is still uh, uh, hasn't uh, been awarded a tender. I know the first tender process apparently was unsuccessful and they're prepping the second tender. I would just ask um, that this be given priority uh, when looking at, uh, at that area by the CEO if possible just taking into consideration the importance that this has uh, for tourism uh, and revenue for um, that uh, that particular part of, of Table Mountain. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Bryant. Can you start with the one of Honorable Kancho and then conclude with the one of Honorable Bryant? Uh, Honorable Chair, if it is um, acceptable to you, uh, can we revert with uh, proper numbers, accurate numbers regarding the, the question about how far are we from Honorable Guancho? Uh, I would be uncomfortable for us to, to provide a knee-jerk reaction to that. Um, so with your permission, sir. And Honorable Bryant, the matter of the uh, tender for the old tea room uh, on Table Mountain uh, being prioritized is, is noted. Thank you. No, but see, oh, Honorable Ganjo is saying when we went to visit yes. 
Kruger. There yes, was sir. a building that, that had already been started. Now, what yes. he's asking, are we at 50%, are we at 75%, or are we at 90%? I, I hear you. Um, uh, I was I was just trying to get hold of Mr. Mtimkul to get that exact number. She, he's just been cut with load shedding, and that is why I was requesting your indulgence, uh, Honorable Chair, to ensure that we have accurate numbers that, that we're sharing with yourselves uh, okay. in response to that question. Yes, so my colleague in the Kruger who has the... The information at his fingertips has just been cut off due to load shedding. Apologies. No, that's fair enough. Yes, thank you. That, that, that's fair enough. No, no problem. Um, can we can we just get that response? I'm I'm not too sure. I, I think it's not a very difficult question. Uh, Twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty, seventy-five, something. Um, uh, perhaps in writing, if you are unable to get in before we conclude this meeting. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to the leadership of Sun Parks. Uh, <clears throat> can we then move to Isman Galiso? Uh, Minister, you want to introduce the team of Isman Galiso? Um, Chair, good afternoon once again to yourself, to Deputy Minister, to all the honourable members and um, also to all the um, colleagues who are still online from DFFE and our entities. First of all, Chair, um, with your permission, I would want to release the Sandpox team uh, from the meeting. Um, if that's acceptable to you, Chair. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I think uh, we're done with them, Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, I think that um, you would probably in the beginning have received the apology of the CEO um, of Isimangaliso, uh, Mr. Bukasini. Um, I think that honorable members are, are probably aware that um, he lost his mother yesterday afternoon and um, obviously um, we, we did have an opportunity to extend condolences to him. Um, so he would not be, be with us. But um, the, the, C, the CFO of Isimangaliso is with us and um, she will be doing the presentation. The one um, suggestion I would make is that if there are detailed questions about the follow-up with regard to the estuary mouth, that um, we respond to those questions in writing. The, the issue, Chair, is that on, on matters of EIS, I'm the appeal authority. So I wouldn't want to get involved in the, the issues um, here in case there, there is an appeal. Um, and um, Mr. Bukasini had indicated that um, there, there may be a requirement um, for more detailed information and he would want to give you that information in writing. So that is all I would want to say, but otherwise um, let me hand over um, to the C the CFO of Isimangaliso and request that, with your permission, they can do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Minister. Please pass our sincerest condolences to the CEO of Isimangaliso. Um, we wish them strength during these uh, difficult times. Uh, can we then, do we have the chairperson of the board? Yes, uh, I'm your chairperson. Over to you, over, you, over to you. Oh, my, my humble apologies. I, I didn't see Nkosi in the meet, in, when I looked in the meeting, <laughs> but otherwise let me hand over uh, greetings. <laughs> okay. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, 
Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, uh, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, fellow board uh, chairperson uh, from other entities, DG in absentia, uh, executive officers, and uh, everyone in participation uh, to this uh, meeting uh, in the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson, for affording us an opportunity to present uh, as the Simangaliso. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for giving that uh, background that uh, because of uh, the CEO is not with us. Uh, in the meeting, we might not be able to take all the questions, but I think we'll cover what uh, we can cover uh, as an entity, since we got uh, two members that are that are in attendance, uh, the CFO and uh, uh, one of the executive, uh, Lungi Duli. I think we'll be able to answer uh, some of the questions that uh, we'll present uh, before you. Uh, as an entity uh, chairperson, uh, we had planned uh, for 58 output indicators for, 20, for 23, 24 uh, financial year. The 58 output indicators are divided uh, in, in programs uh, so that it can make our work in order and achievable. Uh, we have a corporate support service. We had 12, uh, it's been achieved. Uh, biodiversity conservation. We had 11, it's been achieved. Tourism and business development. We had 14, it's been achieved. Uh, social, economic, environment and development. We had 21, it's been achieved. So the whole uh, total of 58 has been achieved accordingly. The implementation of uh, St. Lucia Mount Panel uh, of Aspect uh, report, uh, we got uh, some uh, recommendation uh, that I uh, uh, explained accordingly in the plan. Uh, thus far, we are happy to uh, to to implement the action plan in that regard. The plan will continue to make uh, a dent uh, towards address, uh, addressing unemployment through the environmental protection and infrastructure program, the youth employment uh, sector uh, transformation gender-based violence strategy implementation will, will be continue to be addressed through Khun Savenza internship program and environmental protection and infrastructure program. The plan will continue impl uh, uh, implement uh, commercialization as the approach to identify own contribution to uh, COPEX and uh, outpacks. With this uh, being said, um, a chairperson, I will let uh, the CFO uh, to give more uh, info uh, to the presentation so that we can cover uh, the most presentation that it was prepared uh, to be presented to the uh, to the portfolio committee. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I think in that note, I will then hand over to the CFO. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson of the board and thank you, Chairperson of the portfolio. Um, good, good afternoon, uh, members of the portfolio. Um, I um, hope I'm audible. Thank you so much for flighting the, the, the presentation for Isma Aliso Wetland Park. And um, thank you, Minister, for the opportunity and also Deputy Minister uh, for the opportunity to afford Isma Aliso to do the presentation on the annual performance uh, for, the, for this current year, which is 23-24. To, to Parliament, as, as for the department mentioned, we are in our last year of the strategic five-year strategic plan. So we are finalizing our five-year plan in this financial year. So we are looking at closing the gaps where we had planned for the previous five years in this year. As Isi Mangaliso is in the presidential uh, poverty note, our most uh, uh, challenge if we go to the next slide, is that our most challenge is that the area where Isma Aliso operates is, uh, is having challenges around the unemployment. As you will be aware that Umkanyago alone is, is, is sitting at about 42% unemployment rate, which include unemployment of, of, of the youth, 51%. And in order for us to address these issues, 
um, EPWP in, in particular programs are able to assist us to achieve or to contribute to the district development model uh, tool, which if you look at the next slide with the budget that we have provided of 349 million, we are able to, um, to, 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 to extend into SMME of about 311 and created job opportunities of about 4,700 in the previous year, as well as uh, 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 putting at least of that amount of 4,352% was for the youth and 46% of it was the, 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 the woman. If we can go to the next slide, if we look at our previous three years, we have been uh, uh, starting from 2020 to 2021, we've been achieving 100% and also in the previous year of 2021-22, we've been achieving 100% of the uh, 57 target that we had uh, uh, out of the four programs that we have. And in this financial year, we also prepared in line with these programs. And um, in terms of the forecast in this 23-24 financial year, as the minister indicated, we have the outcome of the panel, which in this particular year, we are implementing the recommendation of the St. Lucia Mouth uh, uh, Expert Report. And uh, in, in, uh, that is one of the key points that we are focusing in the 2023. And the second one, we continue to focus on addressing the unemployment through our EPWP programs, uh, 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 which include working for water, working for the wetland, uh, uh, and, and including all our infrastructure projects. We also uh, uh, looking at, uh, 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 at, at in increasing or implementing our commercialization strategy in addressing the issue around the financial sustainability of the park. Though we are talking about at this stage to, to we, we, because currently our funding is, is grant uh, 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 dependent, but we want to start to implement our commercialization plan and our strategy to see we can uh, take some of the amount to have from our own contribution to CapEx and, or, and operational expenditure. Um, changes in our APP, if, in particular, uh, in, in this year, it's, we maintain it's, there is nothing major that we have changed from our previous year um, APP. In this particular year, we are focusing also on our audit outcomes. So I would like to, at this point, uh, on this slide, allow our strategy office, I mean, strategy manager, to take us through in detail or what we have in our APP. Uh, over to Lungi Chaperson, thank you. Thank you, CFO. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, Director General, CEOs present and colleagues. I will be taking you through to the details of the APP. The first slide is just showing um, alignment of the government goals versus the strategic outcomes of the park and aligning those to the four programs. The entity has got four programs. Pro program one is corporate support. The outcome there is compliance with legislation, effective financial management and key risk, risk mitigated. The first output indicator is unqualified audit opinion with no matters of emphasis. The second is 95% expenditure of the allocated budget. We plan to pay our creditors within 30 days as per the PFMA compliance. We plan to collect from our debtors uh, within 60 days. We will be implementing the procurement plan 100% of that as per the allocated budget. Compliance with uh, key statutory requirements 100%. B is spent on majority black on suppliers, 80% is the target. For human capital, we are saying 
we will submit the workplace skills plan to the relevant CETA within the prescribed time frame so that the staff are capacitated and are developed within the workplace and their portfolios. 100% of employee performance contracts will be concluded as per the performance management policy. One occupational health and safety assessment will be conducted. When it comes to business efficiency, we plan to review the ICT governance framework and uh, this will aid us in effective information, communication and technology uh, systems, which will support the business core, the, the organization's core business and mandate. When it comes to putting um, Isma Aliso on the world map to make it a world renowned, renowned World Heritage Park, we will continue to release news flashes and, and, and publish those, those newspapers, 20 of those. Program two is the core mandates of the park, biodiversity conservation. The outcome there is to ensure that biodiversity threats are mitigated and the park uh, World Heritage Site status remains um, untouched. We have got a green energy program strategy, which we are implementing this day. We will continue to implement it. Unauthorized land encroachment strategy, we will continue to implement it. We will continue to monitor biodiversity so that management can take informed decisions. We, we will have action plans um, attached to those three indicators. We will continue to honor the management agreements between Isima Ngadiso and SMV Lokezer and Wildlife as, the, as they are our conservation management partner. We will have four meetings in that regard. We will continue to do environmental audits uh, with our concessionaires throughout the park, 12 of those. Uh, environmental monitors, this is a response to youth unemployment. 130 of those through the grants from the department. We'll continue to clear 75,000 hectares of the alien plants. We'll rehabilitate 2,000 cubic meters of uh, wetlands. We will continue to clean the coastline, 320 of the, of the coastline. Then uh, when it comes to the buffer zone, to ensure that the buffer zone is protected, and is not tempered, tempered with, we will, we will comment on the, person, on, on the applications towards the development within the buffer zone 100%. And um, there will be no unauthorized development or activities within the park. We will comment uh, with regards to those 100%. Tourism and business development, this is the income generator. This is where uh, infrastructure projects, implementation and commercialization strategies nested. We will maintain 30 kilometers of the roads as an effort to respond to the commercialization strategy and to ensure that there is access um, uh, to the resorts within the park. We will also ensure reserve integrity through maintaining the fence 20 kilometers. We will continue to implement the tourism and commercialization strategy, which we have started this year, and also market the park as the destination of choice through five collaterals, three uh, tourism trade engagements, two special events, six epitorials, four media junkets, and 500 media social media posts through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We also uh, endeavor to ensure that there is um, visits paid by the non-paying guest, 96,000 of those, because we've got a suite of stakeholders that we would want to visit the park using different um, methodologies to ensure that we have a non-paying guest to the park. We also have paying visitor entries who contribute to other income towards the park, 180,000. We aim to generate our own revenue, 25 million in this financial year, and also to have one visitor market research completed because we need to get an understanding 
of the perceptions out there about our visitors so that we can respond accordingly. We will be maintaining the park estate um, 100% as per the action plan. The last program four is our stakeholder engagement public relations uh, program. Uh, we aim to improve socioeconomic benefits and conditions of communities living adjacent um, inside and, and abutting the park. We have a number of stakeholders uh, which we engage uh, through meetings. We will be having four fishing cooperatives meetings, four people and parks meetings, four Amakosi forum meetings, 24 traditional council meetings, eight land claims and co-management meetings, 12 municipality and ward council meetings, 68 meetings are set aside for other community groups, we will also be addressing or uh, contributing to the gender-based violence um, strategy implementation through ensuring that 55% of female beneficiaries are supported through various programs. 30 youth beneficiaries are supported. We will be contributing towards unemployment through creating 550 full-time equivalent jobs through the EP programs. 1,250 beneficiaries will be trained through the NQF aligned training programs. 1,400 will undergo non-accredited training. 200 participants will uh, undergo skills development programs under a suite of our projects. 100 people will be participating in our rural enterprise program. Then when it comes to bursaries and tertiary uh, support, we will be ensuring that at least 10 new first years um, students are receiving bursaries from Ms. Mangalis. Then we will also be supporting um, those students, ensuring that the pass mark remains 75% in their yearly modules. We've got an environmental education program where we ensure that schools are visited and um, are told what is Ismangaliso and what is it about, and also our partners. We also have youth rhino ambassadors participating in environmental awareness activities, it's 50 of them. We also ensure that the leadership structures which, um, uh, which are part of Ismangaliso and those that are abutting the park are uh, also included in our conservation awareness efforts. So we will be ensuring that at least two are participating. Environmental calendar days will ensure that at least two events are celebrated since this is a World Heritage Park and also a wetland of Ramsar importance. When it comes to youth um, unemployment and unemployment at large, we will still ensure that at least 200 uh, beneficiaries are part of the National Home Savings Program. But when, it look, when we come to risk areas, we've cited some key risk areas uh, for Isman Ali, so we don't want to lose the World Heritage Site status. We want to ensure that we implement the stakeholder engagement strategy to, uh, to ensure that our relations with stakeholders are healthy. We also want to look at financial insustainability. We also want to ensure that our technology systems are not abused and these are en enabling us to ensure business efficiency. We're also looking into ensuring that at least we get um, an unqualified audit opinion with no matters of emphasis. And we're also looking after um, a safe working environment and also skilled and competent workforce. Uh, I would like to end there, Chairperson, um, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, colleagues, and hand over to CFO to dive into the financial matters. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairperson. Um, just to conclude on around our, our outcome, uh, um, 
output indicators. We just want to indicate that our output indicators are funded through um, the grant allocation from the department of which all, the total revenue of the financial year is 349 million, which um, on the 2020, the following year, which is 360, 367. And of course, as I've mentioned, is that the, the grants, uh, the entities dependent on the grant, as you will see that it is 90% of the, of, the, of the funding that we have comes from the grant and internally generated revenue is sitting at about 25 million and uh, uh, which is like 10% if you look at in total of our internal generated uh, park revenue. But because of, in this particular year, we want to increase our marketing as well as the, the implementation of, 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 of our commercialization uh, strategy where we're talking about triple P. I would like us to go to the next slide. Um, which indicates the, the total budget that we are looking at. As you would see in the previous year, we, 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 there was more money coming from Waking for Water and uh, uh, which came from the department as a result of that, uh, because of this financial year, it's, it's, it's less than the previous year, but we, we, we will be uh, sitting at, we are sitting at about 349. Uh, a, a million in this financial year, which we are talking about the APP for this year. Uh, as I've mentioned, in terms of the expenditure, um, lines around where we have reduced, if you can go to the next slide uh, on expenditure analysis, we, 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 we look at the con uh, contractual cost, such as your maintenance, security, your fire protection, it is uh, provided in our budget. And uh, in terms of the, the, the employees, we are looking at about new 10 vacant posts, which are, in, are now included in our, which are included in our budget, which talks to, in, in particular, six, six of those are talking to the land care managers, which are, are, are to be employed for us to be able to uh, 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 do the Waking for Water program. Uh, a, 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 in a correct way. So this is our expenditure analysis and, and our budget. I, I don't know whether I'm, the, I'm, I'm ahead, but I see that our screen is not moving. So, okay, that, that is where I was. Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. That, that is for Isman Aliso. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Lungin Tuli, please be kind to switch your mic off. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, that is a presentation of uh, East Mangaliso Wetland Park Authority. Uh, may I request that we engage it? Uh, honorable Winkler, you'll be the first. Please uh, proceed, thank Honorable you, Winkler. Thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you for the presentation. Um, what I'd just like to query on is uh, definitely what is happening with the, the farms um, in that St. Lucia area, you know, where there was the massive flooding from the river. Um, and I know the minister had had an engagement there with Cocta, and I just wonder if there's been any progress uh, since that visit. The second issue um, is on the land encroachment. I saw a particular area that spoke to that um with what is that regard to um and has the long-standing historical issues with the the neighboring communities and the park been resolved um and where does that stand presently and then the third issue that i'd like to touch on is the issue of the the mining um and exploration um around the buffer zone and and near the park have there been any further applications um, where do existing applications stand, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Winkler. Honorable Ganjo. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, two questions. The, in your report, oh, let me first appreciate the report uh, from Mr. Mangaliso. Uh, you have made mention of the board strategy session that was um, attended by the executive management. 
uh, of Isimangali, so um, Wetland Park Authority. <clears throat> I just want to, 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 to ask the peoples of that stretch, uh, strategy session and also what were the, the, the outcomes of that session. And the second one, Chair, if they can tell us how many of um, the vacant posts are there in Ismangaliso, and what is the difference in the current budget compared to the year 2022-23 uh, budget for employee-related costs? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Kanjo. Uh, further take us, honorable members. Okay, just on my side, <clears throat> uh, CFO, it is, it, is, it is clear and obvious that uh, 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 like everyone, is, everyone wants to deal with the issue of unemployment. Uh, the level of unemployment in our communities is very high. Um, and, and most probably also in the communities that lives um, in the margins of the protected areas and, and have important uh, implications for this conservation of these areas. <clears throat> this means that the conservation agencies such as Sun Parks and Ismangaliso should look at uh, uh, poverty relief programs and interventions outside these protected areas to shift the attention of uh, the people's expectations uh, away from these uh, national parks. Now, now having been in Umkanyagute and having seen uh, <clears throat> the district demographics there, one wonders whether there are non-conservation development initiatives in, in the broader district that covers uh, uh, East Mangaliso Wetland Park Authority, uh, in collaboration, of course, with uh, other district authorities in that particular district. Uh, if yes, are you able to, to give us uh, the detail? Who are those projects? What are those projects? Um, and what are the areas of collaboration that this Mangaliso might be having uh, areas of collaboration with? Uh, We have lost you. Travis. Yes, if all please proceed. Chair, we have lost you. I'm not sure whether you're done. Sorry, speaking. I did not hear that, Honorable Ganjo. We somehow lost your chair uh, while you were sp still speaking. So I'm not sure whether uh, were you done or. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I don't know when, at what point did I get cut? But the, the, the CFO, were you able to capture my question? Uh, Chairperson, I did hear the part where you were asking about unemployment and our contribution towards the, that. And you were asking that, are there any initiatives that we are doing outside the park with other municipalities? I, 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 I hope that was the question, but I don't know whether we, we was that the question. You, you, you captured me succinctly, uh, CEO. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, I, can I continue, Chairperson? Oh, can I respond? Yes, uh, yes, please respond. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Um, honorable members, uh, obviously some of the questions as, as, as the minister indicated earlier, would like to, to respond in writing. For instance, about the update, of the meeting that the minister held um, uh, with the farmers, because there was a latest meeting that happened last week on, 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 on Friday, 
where the, the, the CEO had to engage the farmers after the outcome of the Section 30A application. So we will be able to provide uh, Honorable Winkler on, on that particular area. And then Lung will be assisting me on the land encroachment. But what I'm aware of is that there was an, IT, an issue uh, that was brought to court around the Futululu matter, um, which the, the entity already, that matter is set in court and um, the, 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 there was an outcome around that matter, which Isma Aliso was, uh, was were engaged, we were, were given an opportunity to go back and engage uh, with the communities, but explaining to them the, the Isma Aliso won the court matter, um, but we can also provide the outcome of the court around Futululu matter. And I would also want maybe to provide in writing any other uh, a mining application. I'm not aware of, 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 of such at the moment of any mining application um, around Ismaili, so around the buffer zone, but we'll be able to provide in writing. And uh, Lungi will also be assisting me with the Honorable Kanto uh, 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 a question around the board strategy. In terms of the vacant post, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what was the budget. If we look at slide 29 of our presentation, was that in terms of the personal cost, the final last year's budget was 42 million. And because of the new cost that we are providing, we have increased our, our budget for this year to, to, to go to 49 million. But this has to address the critical position that we have and also be able to uh, 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 fulfill our mandate around working for water. In, in, in particular, we have about six of those posts that addresses land care managers, which are new position, which were not there. And we are in line with our working for water and they are on contract. They are not uh, permanent, but it, they are on a five-year fixed term contract. Um, and then the question on Honorable Madisa, the chairperson, uh, there is a program that we are working and it is, one of the, uh, I would say the good project that we have around the street uh, uh, model. We are working on municipal cleaning and greening where we have at this point, we have about 380 employment that we have created around our municipalities that will include Ntubatuba municipality as well as uh, Kabisa Big Five. These are outside the, 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 uh, the, 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 the park, but what they do is that they do and implement municipal cleaning and greening uh, 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 as well as in uh, Umtabialingana uh, as well. So in total, we had created about 300 employment uh, uh, around this program of municipal cleaning and greening, which are non uh, 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 conservation initiative. But where it assists, as you approach East Mangaliso areas, as you go to St. Lucia, you'll find that you will not see any paper around uh, uh, from as you as you start approaching around 50 uh, uh, radius uh, uh, where we are we are having agreement with the municipalities. So it, it's one of the great initiatives that we have as the entity. Uh, but I would like to hand over to Lumi to address the four points that I've just mentioned. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. The, the question by Honorable Rinkler on the land encroachment. Um, I would like to remind the Honorable Members that the land encroachment strategy had to be devised due to the challenge that occurred at Sodwana Bay where members of the community were plowing inside the park. They were plowing bananas and the Amadumbe at the time. So we had to come up with the land encroachment um, strategy where we would um, explore the issues of law enforcement in partnership with SMVELO and also engage stakeholders like Amakosi to, to try and, and address the matter. To date, the matter had been addressed because community members stopped plowing inside Sodwana Bay. 
where is on the southern side of the park, the protected area uh, called Futululu, that's when members of the communities from Duruduru decided uh, that they want to go and live inside the park in the Futululu area, which then resulted in the court order being granted at Peter Marisbeck High Court. We will provide the detailed uh, response uh, with regards to the land encroachment strategy. Moving on to the question by Honorable Gancho on the board strategy session attended by executive manage, management. The board, strate, the board strategy session that was um, attended by management happened in September 2022. It is a session where management deliberates on the annual performance plan of the forthcoming year to see which targets are we putting in, which ones um, are we addressing, and how are we going to contribute to the five-year strategy ultimately. So it is a collective um, workshop where management and the board members, and as well as the CEO, sit and deliberate on the issues uh, revolving around the implementation of the five-year strategic plan, but then dissecting it into the annual performance plan of the year ahead. And obviously having to submit the annual performance plan to the department as per the departmental compliance calendar. I think I have responded to the issues otherwise um, the issue of the outstanding issues, we know that, uh, for example, we've got uh, unresolved land, land claims and we are working on those. So any other questions that we may not have addressed thoroughly, we plead that we respond in writing accordingly. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Winkler, is that the legal Yes, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, honorable members, I invite you to take the last bite. Can I invite the honorable members to take the last bite on the Isimangaliso presentation? Chairperson, I'm, I'm covered by, so no, no problem for my side, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, honorable Brian. Uh, okay, uh, Ingo Sitembe, is there, are there your closing remarks? And then we invite Commissioner Minister, uh, then we close. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Uh, I think um, the CFO and uh, executive member, uh, they managed to cover uh, some questions that they were asked and uh, we also, uh, would be uh, requesting to write down those uh, questions that we did not manage to answer. And uh, we are actually uh, uh, working hard uh, in terms of uh, oh. some of the questions that uh, they were asked. I think as we'll uh, 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 submit them in writing, they will have more, I think they will have uh, the improvement in terms of uh, achieving uh, some of the areas that we need to achieve. Uh, I think those the, 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 those are actually my submission, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Chairperson of the Board. Uh, Commissioner Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Chair, I think let's, let's allow the, the entity to respond in writing. Um, I'm, I'm sure colleagues understand that um, uh, 
uh, the, the CEO would have really wanted to be here and I think would, would really have been in a position to um, engage at a, a, a deeper level on some of the, the issues with regard to communities. The, the, I mean, the, the technical details uh, the, the department will present. But what I can say to colleagues is that there really was a very big difference between the visit I made to Isimangaliso last year and the visit that I made this year. And I think the big difference is the very impressive work that the organization has done to repair relations with communities on the outskirts of the park and also to ensure that to the, to the extent possible, there should be benefits in the form of job opportunities, but also in the form of of, um, being a, of, of small businesses being able to provide services to the park. And I think that was something that, that really was very encouraging. Um, and I, I did manage when I was there to engage with a number of um, small businesses that, for example, through the work that they have done on upgrading accommodation, um, have managed to improve their CIBD status and they're now able to, to tender for, for bigger um, work. I, I also met with young scientists that are, are serving a, an internship apprentice in Isimangali. So, you know, we're trying to do a lot to deal with the fact that, that young scientists um, find it extremely difficult to get employment. And um, there were there were also a number of of communities where um, we 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 have been in a position to to provide um, extra work opportunities. I think that um, the the main issue that was raised with me was that we need to do more um, for those who don't who who for for men who would be over the age of 35, um, because our targets tend to be with regard to women and youth. And um, we did undertake that, that we would look at that. Um, there are additional um, work opportunities that are going to be coming and, and we will be looking at that. You will also remember that, that there was quite a difficult relationship with the Nibela community in the north of the park um, and particularly with those um, aspects of, that would have been involved in, in fishing. Um, again, I think there's a, there's a much better relationship and we're, we're also taking um, work opportunities into those northern areas of the park that really um, would have been much neglected in the past. So one, one, the flavor of the relationship, um, I think, has, has significantly changed. And, and that was, um, I think, very pleasing. Um, I, I know that um, there, there have, since the decision was made to, to move ahead with um, the, the, the scientific work on the clearing of the channels, there, there have been a, there has been a couple of public meetings and everybody's working together on that. So I, I did get a, a sense of much, much better community working relationships across all communities, um, but both, both um, historically disadvantaged and other communities. So that, that I think was, was very pleasing. And of course, you know, as you know, the estuary mouth is still open. Um, and finally, all that salt um, is, is starting to move out um, as a result of, of the sustained uh, action of, of the ocean. And once that salt moves, <clears throat> the water will then have an opportunity to move further inland and <coughs> kill the reeds.
Um, so the reeds, the reeds closer to the sea are, are actually um, starting to die. And those involved in, in fishing activities and so on are, and, and tourism activities are, are very pleased that the mouth is, is still open. So that I can just report as my, my impressions um, from the visit. I think that the chapter and verse that, that honorable members have asked for, we will supply in the written questions. Let me thank you very much, um, Chair, for the opportunity. And let me say that tomorrow we have cabinet subcommittees. It's going to be very difficult for me to participate in the committee meeting. Um, but um, I will I will try um, if if it's if I'm finished with the first cabinet subcommittee by 9:30, I will try to log on and and um, just uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, introduce the delegations. Um, but if I'm not able to do that, I do beg for your your understanding because I have to memos in the first cabinet subcommittee um, at, at half past eight tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Honorable Minister. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, with all that being said, uh, we have arrived at the end of the meeting. Uh, it has indeed been a very long meeting, very informative. Uh, I want to thank everybody who participated in today's meeting. Thank you very much to all the entities, uh, chairpersons. Uh, we have noted also the passing on of the CEO's mother of uh, Isman Galiso, and we hope to receive some of the feedback that the department entities have committed to give to us in writing. Uh, we hope to see you tomorrow in the continuation of the Portfolio Committee and on Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, as we do public uh, hearings on climate change in the Eastern Cape. For now, the meeting is closed. Thank you very much.